Thursday of each month. And now, the Washington County Quorum Court. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to call this special Quorum Court meeting to order. The purpose of this meeting is to continue working on items pertaining to the 2016 budget process. The prayer and the pledge is going to be handled by J.P. Lisa Ecke. J.P. Ecke. Thank you, J.P. Ecke. Carly, would you call the roll, please? Daniel Balls. Here. Harvey Bowman. Here. Rick Cochran. Here. Robert Dennis. Here. Lisa Ecke. Here. Ann Harbison. Here. Sharon Lloyd. Here. Tom Lundstrom. Here. Eva Madison. Here. Sue Madison. Here. Joel Maxwell. Here. Gary McHenry. Here. Joe Patterson. Here. Butch Pond. Here. Bill Ussery. J.P. Usry has called. He's running late, but he will be here. So, next thing we have in front of us is the agenda. Do I have a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Second. Do, I, do I have a second? Second. All in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed, same sign. Okay. The next thing we're going to have on the agenda is reviewing budget requests, and our first one to review will be our animal shelter. Miss Angela, <laughs> you're on. Okay, so first off, I want to thank Mr. Dennis for um, hooking us up with Walmart and Purina. Walmart has agreed to um, hold a donation drive for us. We're still in the process of getting everything worked out, but I think we're gonna have a donation drive at four locations. So I think that could be very good for us. Um, and it'll be with Purina, which is the brand of dog food that we carry. So I think it'll be really, really good. So thank you for that. Um, okay, so first off, on personnel, um, I am requesting three additional part-time employees. Um, I did ask for part-time to keep our costs low. Um, the reason that I'm asking for one kennel and then two office, um, the kennel is to help us with our weekend uh, rotation. We are, we're staffed, but we're a little light on the weekends and um, you know, just to it, it, kennel and taking animals in, animal control is now running on weekends, which is something that until the second animal control officer was hired, we didn't have for about a year, a year and a half or so. But now he's running, he's on Saturday, a lot of calls are coming in on Saturday, so a lot of animals are coming into the shelter on Saturday. So um, in order for the kennel staff to safely process the animals, and that's vaccinating, deworming, drawing blood for whether it's a dog with heartworm test or a cat with leukemia and FIV testing, um, it really is a two-person job. We're running it now on Saturdays and Sundays and Mondays with just one person. So I am requesting a kennel, part-time kennel person for Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And then two part-time office personnel 
Um, and I am requesting that we do eight hours per day on each of these employees. Um, that will cover us eight hours for six days a week that we're open to the public. We've got a big increase of people coming in the shelter, which is great. Uh, the more people you have coming in, the more animals you have going out. Um, but we are limited with that. Um, and in addition to that, for the last, well, <laughs> since I met with you um, concerning the addition I needed for my budget, I have spent my time focused on grants opportunities and donation opportunities, fundraising opportunities, and that has left a big void in the office. So although I have been able to, as you know, secure a $550 grant from HSO, um, there was a couple. There are a couple of grants that um, that I have applied for. One of them um, turned out to be for 501c3s only, not government. Um, we did have. I secured a donation drive for four to five hundred dollars worth of product. Just a number of things that I've been able to do. But what that's done is left a big hole up front. So now we're behind up there. So just having these extra two people to work three days apiece will allow me to focus more on the grant writing and the uh, fundraising and the additional monies and donations coming in and then still have the front office covered. So um, that's that, if anybody has any questions. Oh, and in addition to that, one of the primary goals will be of the part-time person will also be to keep up with our pet finder. I don't know if any of you actually peruse pet finder much, but we don't have a lot of animals on there. <laughs> And that's because, one, the staff doesn't have time to do it, and the volunteers, for whatever reason, we've just been unsuccessful. We have created several task forces, if you will, for Pet Finder, and they come in and they take pictures one time, and they don't come back. Um, it's not the pictures that are necessarily that difficult, but Pet Finder is very difficult to, to use, and it's very difficult to get the animals uploaded. And... If the animals aren't out there, you know, we have adopted out to all over. We've adopted to uh, Maryland. We've adopted to all of the states around us um, because of Pet Finder. So if we can get our animals on Pet Finder, we can get them out the door quicker, which length of stay goes down, money is saved. So that will be something that um, the part-time people will focus on as well. So does anybody have any questions about that? Thank you, Madam Judge. Angela, I do have a question. Do you know what grade um, each of these employees are going to start at, your part-time weekend and uh, the other two staffers? Um, I don't know what grade. I'm going to say somewhere around the grade 8. It won't be more than grade 8 or 9. Okay. Um, we're talking about maybe the $11, $12 hour range is what we're looking at. Is this uh, in our budget, uh, or is this an addition to the budget on page 115? Well, this should be... In the budget? Uh, yeah, I, I put it in my budget request for 2016. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. this is not addition. It was added into my 2016 that I, that I submitted. On, can I ask another question? On your keg and water system... Uh, are you still considering that? Yes, uh-huh, yes. Uh, On the capital expenditure... Um, oh, I didn't mean... <laughs> Do you want me to go on with that? Well, Talk no, more with personnel? Okay. Let's, I, okay. Let's go ahead and finish the personnel. Okay. Let's pro personnel. Okay. I, <laughs> okay, okay. thought we were doing it all together. I was on the Animal League board initially. I was one of the founding board members. It was my understanding that the Animal League did all the pet finder posts initially, and they were asked to stop. And so if one of the justifications for, you may not have been the director, but if one of the justifications for these additional positions is the pet finder work, which I think is valuable work, I wonder if that issue has not been explored with the Animal League because they are very well trained on how to use pet finder. Um, I think Rachel Sloan took all the pictures and they were posted uh, daily. Well, I can certainly ask them. I have no problem asking them to do that. I, I know Carmen Nelson and Rachel Sloan had done that before for the shelter and were asked to stop. Okay. So, 
Well, I didn't ask them to stop, so I certainly will definitely ask them to start again. I mean, I'm not sure, you know, I mean, I have no problem asking them to do that. We've had a very good working relationship. You know, we had a freezer go out last week, and they provided us with a new freezer. So, I mean, they're, they're very willing to help us, but they haven't come forward and said anything about taking pictures for us. So, but I don't mind asking them, sure. Well, and I think, I think probably they didn't because they were asked to stop doing it, and okay. I don't know why. I mean, Rachel is a professional photographer and was donating her time. And um, it, it does it does require a lot of work. I know that, and and I think yeah, that, it does. that that's a good task for um, people to help with because it doesn't necessarily have to happen <laughs> at the shelter. It can oh, no, be no, uploaded no, no. elsewhere. Right. right. Um, they so. just have to come in very regularly. You know, our our animals are moving through. Um, I don't think mm -hmm. we've got a dog that's been at the shelter more than 14 days. You know, I mean, we we move them through very regularly so they will have to have someone who's coming in at least a minimum of once a week to take the new pictures and take off and Pathfinder is very in-depth it's not just you know I mean you know that as well as mm -hmm. anybody it's very it's very time consuming it's time consuming to upload everything and then you've got to manage it as far as keeping adoptable pets on there taking the pets that are adopted off of there and all I, th of that I think of Rachel stuff. was being close to being there almost daily so I mean I, I don't think that her I know she's had another child since then, so I shouldn't speak for her, but um, I know she was able to be there on a fairly regular basis to keep up with uh, with your volume. Hey, if they're willing to do it, I'm willing to let them. I mean, we we need it. It's very important to have that stuff because if people can't, people are calling us saying, you have no animals on Pet Finder. I know. You know, I mean, that's a big struggle for us. <laughs> so I... I you know, the last time you came to us with a personal re um, services request, you wanted one full-time person, and we gave you one half-time, and that was less than a year ago. So I'm a little curious why suddenly we now have such a jump um, that we've grown so much since then. It's not really a matter of growth. We just need the extra help. Like I said, we're very limited on the weekend. Um, we need, you know, some more help there. We've already had one workers' comp claim. Um, actually, as a matter of fact, we've had two, and it has been on the weekends because she's trying to do the work of two people. Um, and then two, just having the office help will free me up primarily so that I can go after more grant work. If I'm not up front answering the phone, helping customers, helping out with the filing, making files, all of that sort of stuff, helping with a public spay neuter, if I'm not doing those things, I can focus my time on the grants and things, and yet my office doesn't get behind. Because when the office is behind, then I can't print the reports, I can't keep up with my stuff. You see what I'm saying? So if we could just get a, another couple of people up front to help us, one person each day, then that will help to offset the influx of people coming in, because we do have a lot more people coming in now. Um, but in addition to that, I can focus on primarily getting more money. Do you think it's realistic to think that these will be very attractive positions with them being part-time? Um, you know, it, it, I, can, I can tell you from what when we've tried to fill the part-time position, which is actually something we're trying to fill right now, um, we did have a full-time kennel supervisor leave, um, and he just basically stated he couldn't, he couldn't handle the it's position. Ha it's hard work. It I is mean, hard work. And and not to speak ill at all <laughs> of our inmate program, it is a fantastic program, but it is very challenging. And it takes a very unique person to be able to train daily somebody new, you know, because... Well, I mean, but, the, but the work of animal shelters is hard work. It is, I mean, all you, the way around. You deal, you deal with truly life and death decisions, yes. and that can weigh on anybody, and you're, you're going to have more yeah. turnover than due to just the... Exactly. emotional aspects of it than anywhere else it's a hard exactly. job um, so what I just, we, what I just we sort did, of wonder if maybe looking back at that halftime position that we funded would it be better to make sort of one full-time position that you initially came to us and asked for because I'm, I'm just having a hard time looking at three part-time sure um here's the reason I would really like to have the part-times one because we are open six days a week so if we did part-time then we can work three days and three days whereas if you do full-time then you're basically limited to five days does that make sense so i can cover more area with the part-time um, and that one part-time person is kennel um so that would definitely eliminate well 
it really wouldn't eliminate anything because it would give us more time, more for that person to come through on days where we already have enough staff, whereas if we had a part-time person, we could work them just on the, the days where it's limited. Does that make sense? Um, I would really rather see, as much as I like to see the full-time help, I really would rather see at least part of these part-time positions. I think, I think overall it will be better for the shelter to have more people in the building at any given time rather than making that one position a full-time position and working them. I, that, I don't know that that's going to help me with my gap. Thank you. Yes, hi, Angela. Hi. Uh, I'm the new kid on the block here, so <laughs> I, I don't have a lot of the history, so I'd like to know how you're currently staffed and also what sort of census you run average uh, at the shelter. We have nine full-time employees and one part-time employee. Um, and that includes um, a veterinarian and two uh, veterinary technicians. We do the low-cost spay and neuter program as well as the um, spaying and neutering and veterinary care for the shelter. Um, and we've got um, approximately, we've been averaging for the last two years, of course 2013 was our first full year, 2014, second full year, and we run about 2,300 animals a year. A year. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. At, now any we, one, at any one week? What's the average weekly that you would be? Well, doing? during puppy and kitten season, um, we average about 180 animals. Um, on the off season, we were average somewhere around 100 animals. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Madam Joe. Just a comment. With our business, we have part timers and we like them because it helps almost eliminate the overtime that we can run into during what we call the fresh seasons, which is October, November, and December, when we're running six days a week. And uh, having those part-timers saves our company a lot of money in overtime. And that's why I can, I can relate and I understand um, why you would prefer that. And having them in the rotation is uh, a good economical plan for eliminating that over time. Just want to make a comment. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Angela, the uh, volume that you experience of customers coming in through the week, Monday through Saturday, can you give me an idea of, of what Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday are like? Uh, well, Saturday is, of course, our busiest day. Um, we are averaging through the door about 1,800 to 2,000 people um, walking through the door in a month. So divide that down. No, that but I mean on a, on, a, on a weekday basis, uh, do you have a slow day? Uh, n no. I mean, Monday, any given, any given day maybe. Mondays, I would say, maybe our slowest day. Um, but even still, we have 100 people walk through the door on a Monday. Saturday <laughs> is definitely the day that we've got several hundred people that are coming through. Certainly. They, they're off work and, and yeah. available to go. Yeah. But surprisingly, you know, through the week, we're just, it, it's, it's actually, it is very surprising how many people come through the door even through the week. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular heavy time of the day? Um, well, probably I would say, what do you think, Tammy? The first half of the day? So you're getting a kind of lunch hour traffic and after school traffic. Right. Have you explored the idea of possibly looking at uh, reducing your open hours to where you can take a person and, and take their 40 hour week and stretch it over six days? Uh, you know, I would be afraid to do that. I, no, I haven't looked at it. Um, I think the more hours you're open, the better you I don't know. I haven't looked at that. I'm not okay. going to say that we couldn't definitely look at that, um, but I think because you know we open at 10:30, 
So, and we're busiest between that 1030 to 1130 mark and then after school, you know, 3 to 5, 530. And we're open 1030 to 530 right now. <clears throat> Well, I, re I realize that uh, uh, you always have a 24-7 operation with the animals. Somebody's got to be, you know, doing some care even when the doors are locked to the customers. Right. All right. Thank you, Judge. Hi, Angela. Hey. Uh, Angela, I noticed there's $20,000 in here for cleaning supplies. Is that the stuff that used to come from uh, the building's yes. budget? Okay. Yes. And uh, I noticed that <clears throat> there's about a, about a $50,000 increase. And it looks like it's all, most all is coming from the labor side of the mm -hmm. business. Uh, I think Rick was on the same trail here that I was thinking about, of try, trying to identify a period of time where you might be able to uh, either make the services unavailable to the public or to pick a couple half days or something, maybe shut down the afternoons to help keep that down. But uh, you know what we're up against with the budget. So sure, sure appreciate it. I'm really glad to hear that you're doing this thing with Ross and Purine and Walmart. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you give us any idea at all about what kind of uh, uh, dollar savings that we might anticipate with that kind of deal? No, but I expect it to be good. I mean, I expect it to be very beneficial. You're talking about four Walmarts, and they're going to stand. Basically, we're going to have a volunteer at the door at each entrance of all four Walmarts. So there's eight volunteers that are passing out coupons and our shelter wish list that says these are the items that we want, here are the coupons that you can buy it for, and then as you're leaving, this is where you, you deposit it. So with four Walmarts, I mean, I, I cannot imagine that it would not be very lucrative. Okay. Well, I noticed that you have a $12,000 budget here for pet food. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I was surprised it wasn't more than that. Well, but I'll tell you what. I also, in my last couple of um, months since we started dealing with all of this budget stuff, I have secured with Walmart um, an opportunity to come to their warehouse in Bentonville once a month and pick up a pallet of dog food and a pallet of cat food. Fantastic. So, right. yes. So, see, there's, again, there's another reason that I really, if we were, if I can focus my time on this if i had that part-time person up front where i could focus my time on this imagine the possibilities for finding this sort of stuff so that's why i actually decreased my dog food and cat food budget was because i know i've got this guarantee from walmart now of two pallets one one cat and one dog every month mm -hmm. so that's a month that's money where we can save okay great yeah well angela i guess uh <clears throat> You know, I think that probably some of the reports written about our meetings uh, make it look like some of us are being really anti-animal, anti-shelter. And, and I hope, I think, uh, matter of fact, a friend shared with me one time, you made a comment about at least I know why Harvey's voting no. And I really appreciate that. But uh, I think that probably you are the best person in this, in this building, and probably in the county, to help us identify areas where we might begin to reduce costs. Because, you know, ever since this shelter has been opened, the cost has been going up every year. And uh, funds available have been going down. And so I just ask you to please continue to look in every area possible to try to help keep these costs down as much as possible. And I think the time issue there with it looking like salaries is a very, very heavy part. Looks like it's probably three-fourths of our operating cost. So if, if there's any way at all that you might come up with something that would help with uh, that labor thing, it would really be phenomenal. And probably Rick's idea about uh, limiting some hours there would be a big help in that area. Okay. Thanks, Angela. Okay, so under capital, um, I am requesting money to purchase the um, Kong and Water system. Um, after that first meeting where I came in and um, you know, I guess as some, as, you, as some of you may think, drop the bomb <laughs> that we were going to need some extra funding. Miss um, Ecky had mentioned, hey, there are ways that I can help you. And so she came down to the shelter and uh, we discussed at length the um, Congan water system. And um, she demonstrated it for me. And I think that there's some merit behind that. Um, I went to George Butler, and he and I um, did some research on our own. And um, 
I think basically what we've come up with is it's not going to take the place of all of our cleaning supplies, but it's definitely going to take the place of our bleach products, anything that has bleach. And then in addition to the bleach, it's also going to um, basically do away with our uh, window cleaner because um, it does, the machine does produce a chemical, so to speak, that does um, very well on the windows. Um, and as well as our stainless steel cleaner. So I think that it's got some merit um, behind it. Like I said, it's not going to, I don't want anyone to be misled and to believe that it's going to be everything that we're going to be able to use it solely, but I think it definitely has some merit there. So. Have you been able to figure um, how, what the cost and the savings uh, from using this machine, uh, producing your own bleach? Um, let's see here. I can tell you what we spend in these products. Um, in 2014, we spent um, $1,053.80 in bleach. Um, our stainless steel cleaner was $469.91, and our glass cleaner was $201.20. Um, in, in addition to that, um, well, this won't take the place of that, but okay. So, um, $1,600 $1, worth of products annually. What is the cost of the machine? The cost of the machine, si go ahead. Six three six six. Tax included. Tax Shipping included. and everything. Six thousand three hundred and where is it? <coughs> it's right here. Capital. Twelve thousand. Sixty three six. Okay, six. So it's six thousand dollars, six thousand three hundred and thirty-six dollars. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, so I want to save us about two thousand a year on supplies. So it, uh, you know it won't be paid off what for three years. Correct. So okay, uh, that's all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Judge. Um, so with all due respect to J.P. Eckie, I have to say that I'm a little skeptical about water replacing bleach as a cleaner. Um, I think about all the viruses that are at an animal shelter, and maybe I just want to smell bleach. I don't know what it is, but I looked at, I looked up on Walmart.com how much bleach costs. The cost of this machine would cover 1,658 gallons of bleach. That's a lot of bleach. It is a lot of bleach. Um, and although it may have, I know she uses it in her food service business, I understand. And I think that I'm just a little worried about the animal diseases and the effectiveness there. So I'm, I have to say I'm a little skeptical, but I'll also say that I'm <coughs> concerned about whether the proposal is actually to buy it from a JP because I don't. I don't know if we're being asked to approve that too, because I think that has to actually require some special. You're recognized. I, I just, I guess, I don't want you to feel like you're in a bad spot because a JP has asked you. I mean, and we all sell our own wares. I mean, I get it, and but I, I don't want you to feel like you're in a bad spot because of that. Um, I, I just, I, is, are are there any studies that have shown that it is effective for killing like parvo? No. I, I, well, I'm going to defer to Lisa on this. I haven't found um, parvo, um, virulent Khaleesi virus, um, and ringworm are the three things that I can't find, that I can't find documented proof on. Now, I'm not saying that she doesn't have it, but those are the things, and those are the three main killers in the shelter. You know, parvo, which spreads to cats and dogs with pan Luke. Um, ringworm, of course, is um, zoonotic, which means you and I get it. 
So that's something we have to have something that kills that organism immediately so that it doesn't spread one to the workers and two to the people who adopt. Um, and then the virulent Khaleesi virus is still just a virus that the current product we use now, the XL, that's why I said it can't take the place of everything that we're using because we know that the XL in our cat rooms does kill the Khaleesi virus, which will wipe out the entire shelter. I mean, cat-wise, you know, it'll wipe your total cat population out. It's very hardy, it's very difficult to kill, and it spreads before the cats even show signs that they're sick. Every cat has it, and then all of a sudden they die. So it's something that... I, I can't find the proof, um, but I really want to let um, J.P. Ecke speak on that because I, I have not found the documented proof for those particular viruses. So, uh, And I guess that's what concerns me is because the health of the animals is why, I mean, cleanliness is important, but it's also about the health of our animal Absolutely. population. Um, and, and then I would like to hear from our attorney on what You're procedures we have to follow because I haven't had that happen. I was told that it was forbidden because um, I no. know when J.P. Candy Clark was on the court and her company considered doing some cleaning, she was um, told she couldn't do it. So you, uh, the, um, I've, had a, I've had some discussions with Justice Ecke on this topic. The court has bought, um, the county has purchased goods and services from J.P.'s, and it's legal if uh, two things happen. One, of course, you budget for it, and that's what I was waiting for before I did uh, the second step, which is an ordinance finding unusual circumstances. In this case, uh, this would not be a bid item uh, because it's under $20,000. Um, so if the court uh, were to find, uh, the judge could buy it with an allocation from the court um, and uh, a, an ordinance passed by this court authorizing uh, the county to do business with Justice Ecke on that particular item. So do we have to find that there are unusual circumstances? Then? Yes, you would have to find unusual circumstances. And what does that mean? That's a wonderful question that I, uh, uh, I, have, I have yet to definitively answer, Justice Madison. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll tell you this, for, for sort of historical purposes, uh, we did business with Herbal Fraley for a while uh, while I was on the court. We've done done it, uh, and that's right. We've done it with Joe, uh, Justice well, Patterson. They are unusual. No, I'm kidding. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, and it seems to me we did just we did business with at least one other JP while I was uh, while I was on the court. But uh, it's perfectly legal as long as we go through the right steps. Um, I just uh, I didn't want to go through the the. Okay. Uh, go through the ordinance process unless it was the court's pleasure to allocate the funds for the machine. Okay. I have one more question for Angela, if I could. And I'm sorry, it goes back to the personal services. I apologize. Um, I missed my, I couldn't find my notes. I was curious, we, we got your budget as a replacement, one of our replacement pages, and your original budget request didn't have the people in it. That was my fault. Okay. I wondered, because I was like, well, wow, what happened in like the couple weeks <laughs> yes. between request no, one and request two? Okay. Uh, it was, when I requested it, what I put in the budget was the additional monies that I needed. Well, but I only did that in the personal services line. Everything else I put actual monies needed. So when Cheryl put it together, she put it with actual monies. And when I was going over it, I went, oh, no, there's okay. a mistake here. That's fine. I just thought I something had changed. But different. if it was a mistake, no. that's fine. Yeah, okay. I, just, it, I just entered it incorrectly. Thank you, Judge. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Judge. I, I have some real concerns about this machine as well. First off, let me ask you, are there not multiple vendors that sell this machine? I would assume so, yes, ma'am. Have, have you looked? No, I'm, I'm, from what I understand, it's, I mean, it's the same price no matter where you buy it from. Okay. Is, is J.P. Ecke a vendor? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I, well, I'll need I, to defer to her for that information, but. I guess I'm struggling with a machine that sort of turns water into wine, so to speak. Surely there's another ingredient besides water. You don't just pour water into a machine, plug it in, and get some kind of super-duper cleaner out of it. What else do you have to put in it? There are, um, J.P. Ecke, do you mind answering that question? There are filters. It will cost roughly about $100 a year to maintain. And um, the, the 
little cantina canisters that you put in that changes the different pH levels in the water is what causes it to do. Um, Debbie Eki, can you explain that? The filters better, change the pH of the water? Yes, ma'am. Let me ask our attorney if this is going to be appropriate discussion here. Which, which discussion, Justice Madison? I'm not. Angela is deferring to J.P. Eckie to answer oh, my questions. Um, you could, uh, in terms of parliamentary procedure, um, you could do one of two things. Individually, you could go through the chair to ask to engage in a direct dialogue with Justice Eckie. That's appropriate. Uh, or um, you could dissolve this meeting temporarily into a committee, in which case you may engage into, uh, in all of you may engage Justice Eckie in turn. <laughs> Sounds a little complicated. I, Sorry. I, that's part of me thinks our shelter director should have a better understanding of the machine than is being displayed. But um, may I ask permission of Madam Judge yes, no, then to have J.P. Eckie speak for our director on the technicalities of this machine? Madam, Madam Judge, thank you. Thank you to the court for hearing this. When Angela approached the quorum court asking for $10,000 for five months for cleaning supplies, I had a conniption. And of course, it was in the paper that I was against the animal shelter and whatnot, because I knew what new technology had, had come to us and what we were using in our business. and ways to save the county money. The next day, I called Angela, and I said, okay, I chewed you out. Now let me help you. Let me just show you what we're doing. If this can help you at your shelter, that's great. If not, that's fine. But this is what we're doing in our industry. And I went in, and I showed her what this machine, it is a registered medical device in Japan, and has been uh, it was developed by a group of doctors because of the needs that they had, their patients needed, number one, diabetic bed sores <clears throat> and whatnot. And what they, they found was this technology. They started using it, and now it's in 97% of all hospitals in Japan. People in Slovenia, in Russia, in Japan, and in the Netherlands, Veterinarians are using this reconstructed green technology in their practice because they're seeing fantastic results. So okay. do you what put I something did, else in with this bottle that's being passed around is, it's, the, it's, it's, is the product? Right. It, this machine, it restructures <clears throat> tap water. I mean, you, you hook it up to your sink, and it goes through a process, and I'll show you the process, and you can look at it. Well, is it is water the only ingredient because it smells of bleach or does it have water, salt? It does. Or? It has a saline solution. So it has sodium chloride in it. And it makes not chloride. It's it just it's just sodium salts. That's all it is. It's a solution. It's not like table salt. You can't use table salt. No. Okay. So, so we get. But you can look at. So I I would rather do it. It's up to the are court. You, are you adding bleach to the water? No, absolutely not. No. What it does, it produces an acidity of 2.5 for that acid water, but it's not harmful. I got that water, and you can get it and put it on your clothes, and it's not going to bleach your clothes at all. It's not harmful to your skin, and this is what we found so fascinating because our employees have to sanitize their hands constantly, and it would chap them. Then we have to buy the moisturizers afterwards, so every... When we started using this, we sanitize our hands and the poultry, you know, it kills salmonella. I was hoping George was here because I gave him all of this information. But if you want to look at the efficacies of it killing bacterias and um, viruses, ATS did an independent study on the efficacies of the 2.5 water and also the strong alkaline water of 11.5. I've been in contact with Dr. Tim Crow, who is a leading veterinarian and teacher, and I've got his information here. 
He is a trauma director, Regional Institute for Veterinary and Emergencies and Referrals in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, and he shared with me what he's doing in private practice with the animal shelter. Um, I've got his information. And I can go over with you, if you want, on all of this water. And I would not have recommended it to the animal shelter if I didn't see that there was a need and we can save money. The life, the longevity of this machine is 20 to 30 years. And that's how. I a machine that will last that long. <laughs> it, it's made in Japan. Um, <laughs> and um, truthfully, I would prefer to talk about this in a committee when it's not about the budget, and I'll answer every question that you want. Okay. The first thing I want you to know is that this is a one-time <coughs> direct sale, because that is what this company is. It's a direct sales company. I have a team, and it's called Eki Team, and that's what we do. We have um, direct sales reps that are part of our team. That's how you sell the machine. In order to keep the price of the machine low, the company uses the direct sales marketing for their um, direct people like me as opposed to advertising. So that's why we do well, this. Well, let me way. ask you just one last question then. How long have you all been using this machine? At work, we've been using it for three years. Personally, at home, we've been using it for five years. And with, uh, with I don't buy the Windex. I don't buy 409. I don't buy toilet cleaners. I don't buy any of those things at home. I've gone green. This is cutting edge green technology. And I wish George was here because he's done a lot of research and he contacted independent um, doctors that have done research on this and he was excited about it. And I approached him, I said, I don't want a conflict of interest. You tell me how to proceed. I said, number one, I never dreamed about holding political office. It was something that just all of a sudden there it was. And even when I knew before I took office, if I had a motive of selling something like this to the county, I would have done it before I was in office. I didn't see the need until Angela said, I want $10,000 for cleaning supplies. And you all know I had a conniption. Yeah. Okay. And so that's when I said, I think I can help save you money. So. Thank you. I'm going to recognize the county attorney right now, if y'all excuse me, just a minute, go ahead. No, uh, it sounded to me from what Justice Eki just said that she would rather not consider this tonight. Um, I was going to suggest anyway that you consider, because uh, Justice Eki shouldn't be voting on anything that puts, uh, and Justice Eki, I, I know you, I'm not, uh, I, she shouldn't be voting on the purchase of this machine for obvious reasons. So I was going to suggest uh, splitting uh, Angela's request into personal services and this capital. Um, anyway, uh, it seems to me like the prudent thing at this point in time would be to table the capital request uh, based on Justice Eckie's statement from just now. Ma Madam Judge, do I still have the floor? May I just finish up? I wanted to ask our director if you know of other shelters using this machine. At this point, no, ma'am, I do not. Well, I'm having a hard time understanding why if J.P. Eckie says it kills viruses, you can't find any documentation that will kill parvo. Well, parvo is a virus that, I mean, it's not like, you know, we catch viruses all, all day long. Sure. Viruses, parvo is hardy. It lives in the ground with freezing temperatures, with 100 degree temperatures, and it lives there for years and years and years. So it's something that is very, very difficult to kill. Same thing with the Khaleesi virus. So it's not, I'm, I'm certain that bleach kills viruses. I just don't, I haven't seen, you know, and parvo is one of those things, you don't dare do a study in the shelter to see if it kills parvo no, because no. obviously you will 
if it doesn't, then you you kill any animal that you're subjecting that to after that. So, yeah, I just I just don't I, I don't I haven't personally seen any okay. studies for the parvo virus, and it's because parvo is extremely difficult to kill. Okay, I I think I'm really struggling to understand this about. Well, did did J.P. Pond make a motion to table? I'd like to second it if he yes, did. Yes, he made a motion to table this until later, and then you second, second it. Yes, thank you, and I'm done. Thank Any you. Any discussion on this? Anybody want to make? You can vote on the motion to table. Okay. All in favor of tabling this, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we have tabled it to a later time. Now let's go back to the... Uh, Okay, go ahead, Judge J.P. Longstreet. Yeah, I wanted to make a comment or two on this. I've, I've mentioned it before, but my whole adult life has been involved in sanitation. <laughs> we manufacture detergents and chemicals and so forth, and we have sold them for years. When you deal with the pH scale, the pH scale runs from 1 to 14, and it's a logarithmic scale for every increment it's multiplied by 100. A product with a pH of 8 is 100 times as alkaline as pure rainwater which is neutral, 7. It's essentially the only neutral item in nature and it's not neutral anymore because now we get acid rain and what have you. But the logarithmic scale multiplies everything by 100. When you get down to a pH of 2.3 you're like 100,000 times more acid than water. Okay. <clears throat> this is important information. A lot of pathogenic microorganisms will not live in a pH of 11, for example. Some will not live in a pH of 2 or 3 because they're just not able to survive in those uh, pH scales. But when you deal with with microorganisms, particularly pathogenic microorganisms, whether it's human pathogens or, or animals, these products are all controlled by the USDA, EPA, etc. And you have to be able to prove we manufacture a lot of disinfectants, and every one of those disinfectants have to be tested and approved by the US government before we're able to ship it. We have to send a sample in. I got a sample of this machine from Mike and Neil. He's got one of these in his restaurant <laughs> a few years ago. Now, whether it's doing the same thing uh, J.P. Eckes is, or, I don't know. But he told me it would cure anything I had. Just drink it, wash with it, do whatever I want to do. So I don't, you know, it's either got a pH of 2.3 or it's got a pH of 11. I don't know which, or maybe it can vary it back and forth. But I sent a sample of Mike and Neil's water to our laboratory in Dayton, Ohio, and it tested water. <laughs> it, had a, it had a pH of 6.3, which is basically what water is. If, if I go out there in that tap right now and pull water, it's going to test a pH of about six, six to seven somewhere. Swimming pool water should be maintained from seven to 7.2, which is just barely alkaline. That's why it's not supposed to burn your eyes and all that. When you look at different microorganisms like salmonella, you talk about salmonella, there's like 20,000 different strains of salmonella. Many of them are airborne. Salmonella cholera seuss is what produces cholera. Sal Salmonella typhosis is what produces typhoid. Uh, you know, you can just go on and on. But the, you know, the, the products, at one time, I, I had all of the sanitation in every, in, in every one of the 14 hospitals in Northwest Arkansas. Did all their OR sanitation. I had all the sanitation for the meat markets, the delis, and everything else in all 40-some heart stores. So this is where you're dealing with really important sanitation. Mm -hmm. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Sure. I'm not a big proponent of bleach because you get bleach in an employee's eyes, he's got about 30 seconds to get it out of there or he's blind. I'm a big proponent of, of uh, quats, as I mentioned here before. 
and they are recognized by U.S. Department of Agriculture as a broad spectrum disinfectant. They're both viricidal and pneumonicidal, pseudomonicidal. So they will kill every known microorganism except tuberculosis. And I've not heard you mention tuberculosis being a problem in the animal shelter. So I don't know. When we get into this other meeting on uh, J.P. Eckes product, I'm very interested in seeing what it does. But just changing the pH of water, I can take water to a pH of 2.3 by adding a tiny dab of phosphoric acid in it. And you know, you'd still have a 2.3 pH. Mm -hmm. There's a jillion different ways to get there. You can go up to 11 by adding, you know, some caustic soda or something to it that's highly alkaline. So, and it don't take a $6,000 machine to do that. It takes a cup, pour it in there. And that tiny amount of phosphoric acid would not hurt anything. But I don't think it would be a broad spectrum. I, I want to see USDA literature on this thing showing that it is a disinfectant, a sanitizer. Now, just to sanitize just means to reduce the bacteria count. To disinfect means to destroy it and eliminate it. So those two words have a different meaning too. So that's, when we get to this other meeting, that's one of the things, Lisa, I would like to see is the documentation. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, I just would like to see it because this is something new to me. But the one experience I have had with this machine that Mike and Neil has, and he was wanting me to buy one, was that uh, all it was was water. So anyway, thank you, Madam Judge. What I have is Pond, Dennis, Bowman, and Harbison. Do you guys want to go ahead and be heard, or do we want to move this to them? Because we've already voted to table this. So, sh sh can, so. Might take 10 seconds. Okay, let's go in order then. J.P. Pond? Somebody already answered my question. Okay. Thank you. J.P. Dennis? I'm, I'm not the smartest guy in the room by any means, just the opposite, but the account that I call on uses a system similar to this for their janitorial supplies, and I don't want to name the name because I don't want to get in trouble at work, but they use it, and so... Just let you know that. J.P. Bowman. Guys, I'm familiar with this thing because of family involvement. I've got a son that's been using this machine for quite a long time. I've got friends who have been using it. The machine produces, uh, it separates elements of the water into an acid base and to an alkaline base. Most of the people buying the doggone thing are buying it to drink alkalized water to increase the pH because most of our foods coffee, soda pop, on and on and on, creates an acid environment. And it's been shown that health is improved with an a, a alkaline environment. So many people are drinking the alkaline material, and a lot of them are just disposing of the other material. And so I'm familiar with it, and, and I've heard some really great stories about it, but uh, that's the extent of it. I don't have one, but my son thinks it's a phenomenal piece of equipment. So thank you. J.P. Harbison. I really think that Angela's gives, given some thought to this because if she uses three part-time employees, she can cover her weekends. And uh, some people really want to work just part-time. I think there's a, a probably enough of a pool of people out there that would be interested in this. So therefore, I'm going to make a motion that we hire the three part-time employees that Angela has asked for. Second. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Right, <coughs> roll, Robert Dennis? Yes. Lisaki? Yes. Ann Harbison? Yes. Sharon Lloyd? No. Tom Lindstrom? No. Eva Madison? Yes. Sue Madison? Yes. 
Joe Maxwell? Yes. Gary McHenry? Yes. Joe Patterson? No. Butch Pond? Yes. Bill Ussery? Yes. Daniel Balls? Yes. Harvey Bowman? No. Rick Cochran? No. Ten five. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have in our recorder's cost, Mr. Sylvester. Good evening, Kyle Sylvester, Circuit Clerk for Washington County. Um, coming to you this evening on a personnel matter to request three new personnel slots, full time personnel slots for the Circuit Clerk's office. Um, as of yesterday, we, we uh, went live on our new context court management system. Uh, it's mandated by the state that if our county uh, would like to electronically file, that we have to go to this system. Uh, also, the uh, administrative office of the courts are basically mandating the state, each county in the state, to go to this system for information and statistical sharing. Um, if everybody's on the same system, which is hubbed in Little Rock, then they can accurately uh, run the statistics on the legal activity in the state of Arkansas. Uh, the difference between what we had before we went to this system is that when a case comes into our office, uh, we, in, we start entering the information into docket, scanning images, and, and things to that effect. With this new system, they have the statistical uh, codes that they have to add to each case, which basically doubles our data entry. Uh, another, another thing we discovered with this new system is that on criminal cases with multiple defendants, before we went to the system, we could open a case <coughs> with the state as the plaintiff, and if you have five different defendants, it would be one case. Uh, in this software system, you cannot do that. You will have to have five separate cases and link them together. So now not only are you at doubling your data entry with statistical information, you have just <coughs> added it five times over uh, to be able to get the correct statistical information to the state. Um, so right now, with the, with the docketers that I have in criminal, domestic, juvenile, and civil, um, the job that they were doing before has way more than doubled. And that's the reason that I'm coming to you this evening and asking for three new positions. And I'll be happy to field any questions. Do you plan to pay, uh, it looks like the recorder's cost fund, the estimated revenue for next year is $2,252,555. And your cost for estimating cost for 216, and I assume that that $807,258 are those positions in that total I would have on to. page 179. Yes, ma'am. They're yes, in that are. total. So you're basically, you have the money in your office to pay for this, and it's not coming out of general? Correct. That's correct. Okay, thank you. I wanted to say that I'm a user of this system. <laughs> I have been using Context and Court Connect and these for some time. Um, it's a tremendous advance for the circuit courts in Arkansas uh, for what it's doing. It's making rural counties that, um, I know Washington County is not exactly a rural county, but uh, it's making the courts accessible. I can now get online and go find something in Bradley County down in South Arkansas and pull up a case immediately. It's the way the federal courts have been. It, it's making the practice of law and the access to the courts much better. It's a tremendous amount of work. I have watched as 
I watched as Pulaski County, which was the first court to go on the system, watched as they did it, and now I've watched as courts around the state have come on, and it's, it's a very time-consuming, tedious process because there are some courts where I get on and I can tell that they're still uploading information because you just don't find very much on it, and it's just a very slow process. Um, and, and I met with Kyle about this request, and as a user of the system, I know that we're going to need more people to support it. It's just simply not doable. And this is kind of another one of those things that, to some extent, the state is pushing on us because the administrative office of the courts has rolled out this system. It's the system they've chosen. I would argue over whether it was the best system. Sorry, it's not exactly as user-friendly as it could be, but it's, it's information that's accessible. Um, and so our circuit clerk's duty is to support the courts, and then we as the quorum court are obligated to support the circuit courts and provide facilities and resources for them to function. And so our circuit clerk really has no choice but to roll out this system and because we are the third largest county in the state, it is a much bigger process than the other courts have had to go through. And so as reluctant as I am to support new positions, I, I know from my research and my knowledge of this that it's something that we need to do. It's also my hope, and I've told our circuit clerk this, that my hope is eventually we could maybe talk about phasing these people out. But right now, the implementation of this program is too long. Um, to, to know when that end might come because the way they put courts on is you first start with making your documents available electronically. The lawyers and the litigants still have to come and file things the old-fashioned way so it doesn't reduce the work of our in-person staff up there that deals with <coughs> people in person. And so it just creates additional work for the electronics and the technology of it. Eventually we will go to e-filing, where lawyers will be able to file things from their offices without ever coming to court. When we get to that point, you might look at, you know, some sort of type of savings of, of hours in the clerk's office, but the court won't let us go to that process until at least a year in, right? We're, lo we're looking at approximately 18 months before we'll be able okay. to e-file. Yeah, it's a, it's a long time, and so, because um, I know that I've watched the federal courts go online the poor people that work over in the federal court's clerk's office never see anybody anymore because they don't file anything in person. Everything's filed electronically. We're a ways away from that. So this is a process that we need to deal with. It's good, it's good um, for the public. Uh, it's just going to cost us to do it because I, there's no way that he can take on this additional work with, what, with the staff he has because it's simply an addition of responsibility, and it's quite tremendous. So... Just, just, wasn't com really a just, comparative, <laughs> just comparatively speaking, uh, our neighboring Benton County is, is approximately the same. They have six circuits. We have seven. Um, we carry more volume as far as caseload and, and scanning and documentation uh, than Benton County does. Uh, and I'm very good friends with the Benton County circuit clerk. We share statistics and information as best we can all the time. And she has 34 full-time staff members that are stretched to the gills. I have 22. And I'm, I'm, I, I need three people. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Judge. <clears throat> Kyle, uh, are, I think you're anticipating an increase in load during next year, the number of cases you're going to be handling? I, I can't really forecast what, that, what that's going to do uh, as far as the court side goes. It just kind of depends on what comes in. What I can forecast is the amount, if it remains the same, the amount of data entry will more than double with what we have as far as time consumption. Mm -hmm. We're starting behind. We went live yesterday and we're already behind. It will probably take us a month and a half, maybe even two months to catch up to where we were mm -hmm. just with the data entry. Mm -hmm. Speaking with uh, Brenda DeShields in Benton County, when they went live, it took them three and a half months to catch up. Mm -hmm. We didn't have as much lag time as far as not entering things into the new system from the old system. So we're kind of at an advantage there, but 
it's, it's still going to take some time. Plus, you, you have to look at the learning curve. As we continue to use this, it will become more familiar and we'll get faster. I, I guarantee it. I have a great staff of people, and they're very, very good at what they do. Okay. So a lot, a lot of it is speculation and anticipation, mm -hmm. but without having actual knowledge of how this is going to go. Yeah. That's about the best I can do. Okay. Well, Kyle, I guess one of the key things, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't the entryway and, and time involved there. Uh, I know that uh, you collect fees for your services, and any time you exceed a million dollars in your budget, it goes over into the general fund. Yes, sir. How much will you wind up contributing to our general fund this year from your office? I would have to defer to Treasurer Bobby Hill on his forecast. Probably around 700000 700000 Okay. And I guess my thought process here, if you're contributing 700000 to our cash flow, uh, that we ought to be kind of generous to help out with this kind of situation. But um, I, I was under the impression that you were anticipating an increase in cases you're going to have to have next year that would uh, also feed into this situation. There was, I, I was asked uh, probably about a month ago, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Judge, about um, looking at the difference of the numbers over a spectrum of time. And a document that I was given uh, was from my predecessor that looked at the differences between um, the year 2000 to 2009. And it showed a vast increase of caseload, uh, documents being uh, scanned in. It showed what everything that my office did and how much it had increased. So what I did and, and what, what the judge was requesting um, was to look at how much that has increased since those last numbers. So I ran the reports in our, in our court management system and in our uh, real estate uh, recording system, and I came up with the numbers that they, that they produced. And in comparing from 2009 to 2014, um, some numbers were higher, some numbers were lower, and I didn't really understand that. So I went back and I ran each and every year through our court management system and our land recording system, and the numbers that were in 2009 didn't jive. They weren't the same numbers in my system that were on that piece of paper. So I started going back and asking people, even previous employees, where did these numbers come from? Who compiled this report? Because I don't have anything to compare it to, and nobody knew. I still don't have an answer to that. So my baseline was skewed. Um, but what I can tell you is the numbers that I have run, um, the numbers are pretty consistent, you know, with, with small percentage of variance and increase. Um, but again, with real estate markets and also with criminal activity and, and domestic activity and things like that, it's hard to forecast. Okay. All right. Well, I guess the $700,000 is a reference point that I was looking for. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Madam Judge. Uh, Mr. Sylvester, you're asking for two, no, three additional uh, clerks, and you call them docket, um, yep. new docket clerks in our office. Yes, ma'am. What are you going to grade those position at? Those, those are entry-level positions, and I think it's a 12, um, okay. grade 12, and I believe their starting pay is, is yeah. um, around Is it on here half. already? I'm sorry? Is it on here, the, the request for the three yeah. on personal services in the back? I, I believe so. Man. 80. Oh, I'm not there. I'm looking at 82. I'm sorry. It's a grade 10? Okay, grade my, 10. My, I, I apologize. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was looking at the other one. I see it. It's my okay. understanding that okay. these people will be it. entry level at $12.31 an hour. Yeah, okay. I was looking on the wrong page, my apologies. Thank you, Madam Judge. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Mr. Sylvester, you run a pretty tight ship, and you're, you're contributing to keeping us healthy in the county. I will move to pass your three-employee increase. Second. 
Robert Dennis? Yes. Lisa Eckie? Yes. Ann Harbison? Yes. Sharon Lloyd? No. Tom Lundstrom? Yes. Eva Madison? Yes. Sue Madison? Yes. Joe Maxwell? Yes. Gary McHenry? Yes. Joe Patterson? Yes. Butch Pond? Yes. Bill Ussery? Yes. Daniel Balls? Yes. Harvey Bowman? Yes. Rick Cogreen? Yes. Thank you. Oh, I just not pushed the right place. Uh, I'm David Ruff, your uh, friendly tax collector. Uh, during the past uh, several years, there's been a shift in the collection of taxes. Uh, when this parking deck, it really began with the parking deck. When people found it inconvenient to come here, they found out that they could go to Springdale and get assessed and collect and, and then get their tags. And so there's been a heavy shift going to Springdale and we either need to enlarge Springdale or what uh, after visiting with Russell, Russell uh, Hill, our assessor, we joined in efforts and we're going to start doing that down on Razorback Road at the Razorback Revenue Office. And by doing that, that'll uh, eliminate us having to put more staff out at Springdale. Uh, but it's not going to be an immediate thing. Uh, people are slow to learn, and as we open up an office down there, he's going to put three people down there, and I'm going to put two. Uh, we're 33 and a third percent more efficient than the assessor in our collections. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that's that's how th three to two always works well, and that's what we're going to do down there. It's, in fact, it's about all the room that we got down there, and uh, so in doing so. Uh, I'm requesting one new uh, employee, and I I know that for the first year, it may take a year or so, maybe two, and eventually we can reduce that employee back out of the system uh, because if they're doing all the work down there, we won't need so many here in my office. But uh, until until they get used to going down there, I'm going to have the main traffic up here, and I'm going to have these people sitting down there twiddling their thumbs for the several months till this thing gets to going. And we're going to do advertising. We're going to do several different things to, to inform the people. But as you know, or I don't know whether you know, but it's hard to inform people to get this through their head that there's a new place to, uh, to, to pay your taxes and to get car tax. Uh, and so that is... Uh, what my request is, and also for uh, new people on the Corm Court, like Gary McHenry, uh, we've been friends for a long time. I think we're still friends. Okay, good. Uh, my office is paid out of commissions, and so the Corm Court pays uh, roughly 8.15 percent of of my salaries or any other expenses. And so in this request for $42,323, uh, it's, it's going to cost the county $3,449. So we're talking about about $3,500 here uh, for that employee. Uh, Is there any questions? Let me ask a question. You're only asking for one person, but you're going to send two people down there. You're but you're pulling one of your I'm gonna, I'm going to pull one out of the office. Okay. I just wasn't sure that I was yeah. saying, okay. Yeah. I really need two, but I think, I really think I can get by with one. Okay. I just didn't understand, and I want to make sure the other people knew about this, too. Yeah. Do I? J.P. Madison, you had your hand up, didn't you? To some extent, you answered my question because I was going to ask about the commissioned offices because part of 
what I think made it easy for us to approve the assessor's request is because he's a commissioned office. Right. But he also is going to phase out one of the new positions that he asked for within, I think, two years. But, and this may be a question for our treasurer. I see him sitting back there. Um, but when an office is commissioned, if you don't spend it, does it come back to the general fund like the recorder's cost fund? Yeah, sure, yeah. Okay. Every, everything is done in a final settlement. We also do the final settlement. Any money that's not used throughout the year goes back to the taxing entities, and you'll get your 8.15% back, and the schools will get 82 or 3%, and the cities okay. will get that of any dollar that's left over. Okay. So, I mean, I... It's nice to know that you all have your own revenue source, but to some extent we need to understand that if it's coming out of that revenue source, then it's not rolling over to us if there's extra. So it, it does have an impact on the general fund a little bit more, but you're asking for one position. One position. And, and I, I think that the concept of having an office down at the revenue office is great. Um, it'd be really wonderful if we could somehow have dual employees that could do it all, but I guess the way our we, constitution we, sets us up, we can't do it that way. Well, that, that was asked, that question was asked uh, today, and the assessor and the collector, that's a no-no as far as auditors. Sorry. Now, ah, the okay, collector and treasurer, we could join in together. Man, Bobby, he could have my job here in a few, in another <laughs> year or so. Uh, because I think that there's a lot of people that want it already. <laughs> so. But I tell you what, as complicated as, as our jobs are, they just get more complicated. And okay. so I don't really uh, think that's really that good idea either. Okay, well, fair enough. Thank you. Any other questions? You're not going to let him off that easy, are you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm not going to ask you a question. I'm just going to make a motion that we fund his one position. Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Carly, would you call the roll? Robert Dennis? Yes. Lisa Eckie? Yes. Ann Harbison? Yes. Sharon Lloyd? Yes. Tom Lundstrom? Yes. Eva Madison? Yes. Sue Madison? Yes. Joe Maxwell? Yes. Gary McHenry? Yes. Joe Patterson? Yes. Butch Pawn, yes. Bill Ussery, yes. Daniel Balls, yes. Harvey Bowman, yes. Rick Cochran. Yes. Thank you. Okay, Dana. I've got a, a question. Sure. Do I have to come back for the rest of my budget? Is that because there's increases in my budget that is reflected of expenses down there, and that's where my where my budget has increased. We're going to talk about that tonight, and we'll look at further discussion. So we'll let you, Karen. will let you know. Okay. I want to bring something to the. Something, some, I think, good news. Uh, uh, we'd, we'd love that. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to look at it Thursday night, and that's on the animal shelter, which, uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there that loves animals, and nearly everybody's got animals, and everybody's got animals, but they don't have a conduit to donate to the animal shelter. We do have that ability through my office, through uh, uh, voluntary taxes. And uh, that is something that uh, I sent out, I think, some notices there. Uh, Saline County has broke the uh, path before us, and I sent an ordinance to uh, Steve the other day to look at. They've already got an ordinance. And with that, they collected $100,000 last year by requesting $5 from each of their uh, tax taxing people. Now, that's not necessarily personal property or real, but it's the ones we send out for each statement goes out, it's got that one uh, voluntary tax on there. And uh, normally I, I, I'm i collecting voluntary taxes for Springdale, Prairie Grove, and Lincoln. Each one of them has two different uh, breakdowns. Uh, Springdale does voluntary fire and, and library, Prairie Grove does fire and police, and Lincoln does fire and police. Uh, but considering our budget needs here, I would like to suggest you look into the county extension services as a second voluntary tax. Uh, while we're doing this, it would, it, it would free up more county money if we could do this through voluntary taxes. Let me give you some examples here real quick. Saline County collected $100,000 last year. I'm collecting uh, taxes for Springdale, and when I started collecting taxes uh, voluntary taxes for them, they were only collecting on their own less than $75,000. Uh, last year, I collected $188,000. And 
And this is all voluntary. This is people that are wanting to support their community. And I just feel like we could be that conduit that whenever they're paying their taxes, they said, hey, yeah, I would like to support and help these areas. And anyway, the reason I bring this to you, it would free up more county money, and then that, would, that affects the county, that affects the budgeting process, and that affects the raises of my employees. You know, you sound like an old JP. <laughs> I've thought about this a little bit. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Oh, I have a question for him. Okay, go right ahead, but JP Harbison. I think it would be very uh, voluntary donation. A voluntary well, I donation. I said volu voluntary <laughs> taxes, and that is a no-no. Voluntary fees is a no-no. Uh, we've got into trouble every time we try to use terminology. It would be voluntary amount. Okay. <laughs> J.P. Bowman. Thank you, Judge. David, I really appreciate you bringing that. Do you know that I've had two constituents make that same comment to me? And I was unsure about uh, how to approach it. But uh, I love the idea. And uh, I think that uh, it's something we need to absolutely implement. Yeah. Well, and there's been some discussion on, you know, if you left the line blank on, on the tax statement, you would get no money because they'd say, hey, I don't owe anything here. But if you put something on there like Celine did, they put $5 on there. And with that, they collected $100,000. It's a smaller county than us. But now they collected it countywide. Now, also, you've got to take into consideration, I've got to give you some warning. There is some pitfalls ahead of you. Either you've got to collect it in the unincorporated uh, parts of the county, because if you collect it in Fayetteville and Springdale, Gosh, they have animal shelters, you would need to give them what's collected there. And we can do that. <laughs> and that would even free up even more money if you want to do it countywide or just do it in the unincorporated area. So that's your decision you need to look at and decide on. Uh, and then the amount is the other one, which I really strongly suggest uh, the $5, I think, will get you more money than $20. If you put in $20 there, you're going to get a lot less donations than if you just <coughs> an amount there that a good animal lover <coughs> will help us out with. David, could you not put an option in there of various numbers? Five to twenty. You don't want to confuse no, the taxpayer. Confuse don't confuse the taxpayer. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to confuse them. <laughs> the less said, the better, I have found out. <laughs> well, David, I had a senior adult that's been involved in agriculture all her life. And uh, matter of fact, her father-in-law was my major instructor at Southern State. And she said, I would love to make additional contribution to support the extension service. Yeah. And same thing about the animal shelter. So I think it's a fabulous idea, and I'd like to see us adopt it whenever it would be appropriate <laughs> to make that suggestion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, David. Okay. Appreciate your time and good Bet. suggestions. I think we'll go ahead and take a very short break before we start the sheriff's budget. Uh, thank you, Madam Judge. My name is Jay Cantrell. I'm the Chief Deputy with Washington County Sheriff's Office. Uh, Sheriff Tim Helder is out tonight on a family obligation, uh, sends his regrets that he's out of state and uh, couldn't be here. Uh, you know, he uh, charged Rick and Randall and myself with uh, coming up with a budget this year that uh, uh, was uh, was lean, but but what we needed, and we think that's what uh, what we've come up with. Um, uh, not a lot uh, that we're asking for additional on the enforcement side. Uh, Major Hoyt's prepared a lot of information for you uh, as to our capital requests, and uh, I'll uh, turn it over to him to come up and, uh, and make that presentation. Well, good evening. I'm uh, Rick Hoyt. I'm a major with the Washington County Sheriff's Office. Uh, just to give you a little bit of 
breakdown of how our agency is is formulated. Uh, we have a sheriff and we have a chief deputy, which is Jay. And then from there on, our agency is actually split into two major sections. We have the enforcement and administration section, that's really one. And then we have the detention section. <clears throat> I'm, we have two majors. Uh, I'm the major over the enforcement and slash administration section. My colleague, uh, Randall Denzer, who you see a lot at, at, the, at the meetings, he is over the detention function. Uh, all together, <clears throat> I have about 130 folks that are on my side of the house out of the about 320 personnel that we have working for the sheriff's office. Some of you uh, don't know me. Um, maybe you've just seen me in the hallway or at a meeting and so forth. I just wanted to take just a second to tell you just a little bit about me. I've been in police work now over 40 years. I began my full-time uh, employment with Fayetteville Police Department in 1976. I worked over 28 years with the Fayetteville Police Department and when I left uh, the department, I was chief of police. I came to the county and now I'm in my 11th year with Washington County and I've been a major the entire time uh, working under Tim and Jay. Um, so I'm, I'm proud of the service, but I've had a lot of uh, experience in administrative functions uh, actually since uh, 1996 when I got promoted to lieutenant uh, at, at Fayetteville Police Department. So that is where my experience comes from, and, and uh, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about, about me. <clears throat> this year for our capital outlay, uh, we're asking for the purchase of seven Tahoes. These are police Tahoes, or police package Tahoes. Uh, we get our Tahoes on the state bid. Now you should have some documents in front of you. I provided them last Thursday, and then again tonight I brought extras. So I hope you've got a page that has a letterhead on it. And then uh, backs, uh, you should have two pages front and backs, I think. And the first page is just my justification. And I don't need to belabor that and read all of it because I know you, all of you are capable of reading it. But I'm asking for four by four Tahoes this time. Now we didn't get any vehicles last year, as you know. Uh, no, nobody got any capital items uh, throughout the county. I also provided for you a list of all of our vehicles that we have assigned to patrol and their mileage because I wanted you to, to see that. You have to realize that our, these patrol vehicles will gain anywhere from two to 4,000 miles a month when they're out on patrol, uh, depending on their workload, where, where their assignment is, so on and so forth. Uh, we've never had four by four Tahoes before because at least police package because they weren't available. They became available last year, but since we didn't get any money, we couldn't buy any last year. Our plan is to put six of these four by fours into place for our six sergeants. We have two patrol sergeants on each of our uh, three shifts, and they don't drive as much because they don't answer as many calls. Their job is supervision of the people answering the calls. So we would have them drive the four by fours, and we think we would get a long, longer service life out of them. But during inclement weather, during times that we have to, there, there's times even when it's uh, not ice and snow that we can't get some places in the county, out into certain fields and bogs and crossing creeks. So in those times, those sergeants would be available to uh, either give their vehicles to patrol people, to patrol in them during inclement weather, or they could go out and, and assist in these uh, hazardous areas that we can't hardly get to in two-wheel drive. We've had real good luck with the Tahoes. I've, I've stated in my justification letter how many of those Tahoes we have. You know, we used to have the Crown Victoria police cars, and we loved them. They were the greatest thing. Uh, everybody had them, and uh, I guess Ford got tired of having a good thing, and so they quit making them. And I, we would love to have them again. But I will tell you, these Tahoes, uh, when we first proposed them, we got our first one with a grant. And it has been a, a great vehicle. All of them have been great vehicles. And uh, you have to realize, this is, a, this is the mobile office, OK? These patrol officers, these deputies are out. This is their office. We've got computers in there. They've got uh, cameras, dash cameras. They've got equipment in the back. They've got their stop sticks. There's a lot of stuff that, that is in these vehicles. And uh, 
you can't fully appreciate it unless you just come down and, and sit in one of them and look at all of the stuff that we have. So uh, we're, we really like the Tahoes and they've been doing real well. But we're at that point, if you look at our mileage, um, we're going to have to have some this coming year in 2016. Uh, when, when we didn't get any last year, you know, we, we went and told all the guys, okay, you know, we're, I'm not going to hand out these new ones because we had some on order and they came in. I had eight and I still have four. They're in the process of outfitting them right now. And those will probably be uh, deployed before the end of this year. We have an on-site mechanic that changes out all the equipment and so forth, okay? So we will deploy those last four. We've been very lucky. I always have to knock on wood, but we haven't totaled one out this year. Now, I'll probably just jinx the whole thing. But, you know, by chances, we usually lose a car. We've lost cars to floods. I remember we lost one up in Tawny Town to a, a big flood that we had up there, and it ruined the engine. We lost another one, and when I say lost it, lost the engine, basically lost the value of the car. We lost one in a creek one time that we were fording. Uh, we've been pretty lucky so far. But we do need these um, vehicles. Now, there is a seventh vehicle there. <clears throat> That's for my enforcement captain. It's Dallas McClellan sitting right here on the front row. And <clears throat> you notice it's a little more expensive than the other vehicles. The reason for that is his vehicle will not have the same equipment that we put in the regular patrol vehicles. And uh, the patrol vehicles do not have a console between the bucket seats. There's nothing there. It's naked all the way to the rubber floor mats. And the reason for that is because we have a bunch of police equipment we put in there, such as consoles and police radios and blue light controls and the computer stuff, and, and there's just a lot of stuff. Uh, the, the captain does not have the same equipment, and uh, he needs some place to put his, you know, his portable radio and his keys and all that. You can't just throw that on the floor. And uh, so for $400, you can add a console, and you can also add carpet to it. And I think it's, it's deserving of the captain to have that. Um, at the very last um, paragraph, I, I brought to your attention that we have reduced our request in our operational budget uh, for, for 2016. Um, it's $85,000 in reduced requests. Now, some of that's from gasoline because I reduced my gasoline because gasoline's been coming down in price. Uh, I don't know if that's going to hold. I hope I, it may or may not. So I might have to come back to you if it doesn't hold. But I reduced uh, several, about thirty or 40000 in gasoline. But the rest of it I took out of uh, supplies and other services out of the 2015, uh, or reduced from the 2015 budget into the 2016. I also reduced $10,000 in uh, part-time expenses because I felt, based on the history I've had so far in 2015, that I could get by with $10,000 less in uh, part-time expenses in 2016. So with that, I would like to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Judge. Uh, when we move away from the uh, Crown Vic and go into the Tahoe, the uh, equipment, the, the barrier between the front and back seat and, and uh, grill guards and all like that are, are uh, not compatible. Oh, sir. Uh, do you have that in your budget here? I have it. It's, it's in my minor equipment budget. It okay. has to come out of two or three budgets uh, okay. in the 2016 budget. Right. And so that is covered. It, just for general information, it, it does cost us about $3,000 uh, per vehicle to buy all the equipment. Now, once we get those Tahoes, uh, you know, wall to wall uh, throughout our patrol force, then we won't have to keep rebuying that equipment because it will transfer. Of course, you know, uh, my luck, by the time we get there, then uh, they'll do away with the Tahoes and come out with something else. I don't know, but I hope not. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Judge. I'm just curious what the um, trade in value. On a Dodge Durango with over 150,000 miles and a police package on it is. What do you do with those vehicles? Well, are you interested in it? 
<laughs> I would be interested in the center console for all my junk, but no, not. <laughs> well, no, what we have done in the past is we gather up some of the old cars and uh, sometimes we're able to trade them into a local dealer, uh, in a, like three or four of them at a time, and maybe get a used vehicle. And that's, we, we have bought all used vehicles over the last, well, ever since I've been there for all of our CID personnel, all of our detectives drive used vehicles. We don't buy new vehicles for our detectives. And so we're able to take those used vehicles sometimes. And in the past, I've actually, is this, it just sounded like it wasn't on. Uh, in oh, the, we can hear you. Okay, I'm sorry. Am I too loud? No, no, that's okay. good. In the past, we have actually used excess or, you know, leftover capital money because, like I said in my documents there, in the past, for, for ever since I've been here, we, we've gotten $300,000 every year. This quorum court gave us 300000 and I bought patrol cars with that. And then whatever we might have had left over, we looked at detective cars, court cars, whatever that we needed, and we would take maybe that extra fifteen, twenty thousand, and take a trade in and put two or three thousand dollars with it, and get a replacement vehicle. But it's always used. Okay. Well, let me ask you something that I think I'm learning. You wouldn't be trading these hundred and fifty thousand mile Dodge Durangos the in when you buy the new Tahoes. No, you you use those in a trade-in that never involves the quorum court to get a used vehicle for a detective. Yes, ma'am. The, the dealer that does the state bid does not want trade-ins. I guess I can understand that, but I would think some of the small towns that are lucky to have a, one policeman might be happy to have a trade-in. Yeah, well, now we've tried it different ways. One time... Uh, we, we had a particular car dealer here in town that said, oh, you need to, you need to auction these off. Oh, you'll get a tremendous amount of money. And uh, that, that, that worked uh, very poorly. And, uh, you don't need to be in the auction business. <laughs> well, I don't think so either. And, and it's, it's troublesome to even do it. But we held an auction down there along. It was a county auction. We had other equipment and so forth that the county, other county offices brought in and, and got rid of. And it's just... It's, it's very time-consuming, and, and I don't, I, we didn't make out on it. So we, we have better luck uh, trading those vehicles in, and in the past we were able to put a little bit of cash you know, with it, but uh, we'll have to be inventive and uh, see what we can come up with uh, as we trade some of these in. Okay, I'm just curious, who does the maintenance on your vehicles that you're getting 167,000 miles out of them? <laughs> well... We, uh, we have two places that we have our vehicles maintained. We, right now, for the last couple of years, we've used a shop that happens to be out in Elkins. But for the last year, we're using an in-house uh, person that works, works on our vehicles and does. We don't do heavy stuff. You know, we're not taking transmissions out and all that. But we are able to do things like uh, brakes, um, change out light bulbs and windshield wipers. We're not doing... Um, lubrication because frankly we don't have a, a lift and we don't have a pit and the other reason is we're getting all of our vehicle oil changes done at Everett Chevrolet for less than twelve dollars. Did okay. you did you get a bid on that or how did you uh, no, get that deal uh, with actually Everett? the chief deputy was up there about three years ago and saw a flyer on the wall and it said you know twelve dollar oil changes and he asked about it and it said is that available to to us or is that just a, a special? And he, they said, no, you can do it. We're doing it for the state police. Ever since then, we have done every vehicle, unless it's a special vehicle that has to have, you know, special oil or something, all of our patrol vehicles and uh, uh, cars that are out there get their oil changed at Everett Chevrolet for less than $12 a pop. And I don't even know how they do it. I wonder if the road department knows about that. I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not here to talk about them. <laughs> Well, I saw a county vehicle being serviced at University Auto one day, and I was just a little surprised that uh, it wasn't a police vehicle. Oh, no, okay. No, no, it wasn't. Okay. So I have this vision that every every piece of the county just goes wherever the whim strikes them to get their cars serviced. But it sounds like you all have a pretty good system going. You think Everett Chevrolet would do me for twelve dollars? <laughs> do you? I doubt it. I mean, I think I, I think they're. I know they're losing money because I see the invoice. 
and it actually has minuses and so forth. They lose money on every one of them. But so I it's think a service just, to police departments. They're just trying to do a special for the police department and hoping that they're going to get, well, you know, I went up and bought a, a personal vehicle from them in December, so I don't know if it, I, it was because I got it, the deal I wanted, but, you know, maybe they did I probably ring a bell shouldn't in take my, my Ford then. Huh? I probably shouldn't take my Ford out there. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. That's all okay. I have, Madam Judge. So I have two questions. One is the comment in the third paragraph of the summary in the parenthetical. Because I, I know that there was some discussion about the, the, the vehicles that were authorized for purchase, I guess, in the 14 budget that, I, and I, we asked, I think we asked somebody, it may have been the sheriff, why it took, why they sat in the parking lot so long. And we learned that it was because one person does the outfitting and so it takes some time because we don't get them ready to roll. We get, right. get them with, right. we've got to put the decals and everything on. So I was curious why you, I guess we funded those and then you, you rolled them out even slower. And that didn't make sense to me because it, it suggests that maybe they weren't needed. I don't. No, I, I did that. I mean, that's, that's on me. I did that on purpose. I, if I only have eight and that, we got those in 2014. I've got to make them last. I'm not going to give all these people, you know, new vehicles uh, at, at, at maybe 80,000 miles. Usually we try to get rid of the Crown Vicks and move them off the patrol line at the 80,000 mile mark. But you can look and you can see where I am in the Crown mm -hmm. Vicks now. <clears throat> I'm, I'm well above that, um, that I have out there every day. You know, I've got uh, 106,000, 104,000, 101,000. I don't like having those vehicles out there, but I did that because I didn't know what you all are going to do this year. I didn't have a guarantee I'm even going to get them for 2016. I'm not going to use them all up until I, you know, know that I'm going to get, get some new vehicles. So I basically stretched them out. Um, so my next question is, and this is really more, I think, to put the information out there in the public, because I think there are a lot of our citizens that drive vehicles with well over 100,000 miles. <clears throat> in fact, my husband's truck, a Tahoe, has 95,000 95, miles on it right now, and he definitely has the fever for a new truck, and I'm like, mm, I don't know that you're there yet. <laughs> so uh, at the budget request at our house, the answer was no. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> he does have his own money, so we'll see how that works out. But. And I think that's, that's an issue we need to explore because people certainly drive vehicles past 80 and 100,000 miles, and probably some of us do. And, and cars these days are far more reliable than they once were in terms of you do have additional maintenance issues, no question, that come up at that. But it's not that often anymore. So what is the rationale for setting that threshold well, with I, today's vehicles? I'd be happy to address that. I, I did address it starting in the very last line or two of that first page and, and leading into the next mm -hmm. paragraph on the second page. You cannot compare. It's not just mileage. You've got to understand what it is we're doing in these vehicles and how many times a day. Like, you're talking about your car. You probably get in and out of your car on a daily basis, at least on Monday through Friday, I don't know, maybe three or four times, you know, in and out, slide mm -hmm. into the seat, grab the steering wheel, start it up. We do that 25 times more. You probably don't leave your car idling uh, at the scene of an accident while we're out working an accident or we're working a call and when our car is idling because we... We want to make sure that the, the battery stays charged and our equipment is there and our camera continues to run. It's on the dashboard. You don't drive on some of the dirt roads. You don't drive at some of the speeds, I hope, that we do uh, with our emergency equipment. Y'all would know. <laughs> and, and, and all of these things, going over these uh, roads and dips and through creeks and so forth, have a wear factor. And you can't just look at the odometer and say, oh, well, it's just got 100,000. It's good to go. I'm telling you, you get in a police car that's got 100,000 miles, and you get in another vehicle that a, a regular person has driven with the same amount of miles, and that police car will be much looser feeling. The, the, the ball joints, the control arms, the, everything is, is, is just looser, and it doesn't it, – it bounces more. It, it – creaks more, the doors creak more when you get in and out. 
Uh, there's just lots of things. And so we try to move those vehicles to less demanding roles where it's not people, uh, the people that are going to drive it are not having to drive uh, with their blue lights and siren. We move those vehicles to our civil process division or to one of these court cars that goes back and forth from the different courthouses, um, less demanding. They're not having to drive high speed. You know, the, <clears throat> I, know I don't want to get off into a, a tangent here uh, about, you know, the police drive too fast and all those kinds of things, but I'm telling you, there are times that we need to drive fast. And when you're the citizen uh, out in your house and you're wanting the police and you're getting beat up, or you're down at White House and your husband has gotten shot, you want those police cars there as quickly as possible. And we don't want our officers having to mistrust their vehicles or they're not holding the road, they're bouncing around, they have to have good brakes, all those types of things. Uh, and that's what these vehicles are for. These vehicles are going to the backbone of our department, the patrol division, the ones out there, the boots on the ground, if you will, that are answering those calls for service. Thank you. Well, first, I want to really thank you for your efficiencies uh, and trying to cut your other uh, budget down as much as you can uh, so that uh, uh, we can get these cars for you. Uh, I understand, you know, these cars run all day. They stop and start, and, and understand that why you change them out at 80,000 miles. I kind of learned the hard way uh, in one of my campaigns out, you know, you start it and you stop it, and you go to a door, you come back, you start it and stop it. And then all of a sudden I heard this little knocking, <laughs> and it was like, so I took it in and I said, what's wrong with this? And he said, what have you been doing? And I told him, he said, leave it running. Don't ever turn it off when you're out doing things like that because what's happened is it wasn't getting the oil up there. You would stop it and, you know, and then the oil went. So I've learned the hard way when you're out uh, working all day and you're making a lot of starts and stops that you leave your vehicle running. And, of course, that has wear and tear too. So, you know. I understand why you're changing these out at uh, 80,000 miles, but I really want, you know, to commend you for your efficiency. And I'm going to make a motion that we spend the $217,750 to buy the, um, whatever you want, <laughs> seven <laughs> vehicles, uh, the um, seven Four by fours and the one that you're going to have unmarked. Statute of limitation, and I do believe that the long arm of Texas doesn't reach up to northwest Arkansas. Okay. When I was a freshman in college, my daddy bought me a Plymouth Grand Fury. I believe it was 1977 at auction. That thing wouldn't run smoothly unless it went 84 miles an hour. <laughs> he didn't know that. It was a DPS car that he bought at auction. It still had the light that flipped up. He'd send me off. I'm supposed to be at school in six and a half hours, and I'd make it in four. Four and a half, something like that. And I said, Daddy, you don't understand. It does this unless you go 84. You didn't believe me, but I'm glad you all don't auction your cars because I was a Fast, hot cannon, <laughs> driving around in that Plymouth Grand Fury. It had a lot of problems, though, and I'm glad we sold it. We called it the bomb. But, uh, boy, it was fast. <laughs> Enjoyed it. Got me home safe. That's all. Thank you, Judge. Well, I won't take very long, but I, the average police car, by the time it's got 80,000 miles on it, that engine will probably have run two to three times as long as a private car has yeah. because of the idle time. If you're sitting running radar or whatever, it's going to be running. It's not going to be start and stop all day long. And the second thing is that I want to make a point. You came close <laughs> to making a point. The point while ago is high-speed pursuits. 
when you get in a high speed, high speed pursuit, you don't want tie rods dropping down mm -hmm. and brakes failing to operate because you're chasing a guy maybe doing 110 miles an hour down these Arkansas roads. So it's really important that these people have reliable vehicles. And it's a major job to regulate this many vehicles on a reasonable basis and keep them reliable. So I'm going to support this ordinance. Thank you, Thank you Judge. Thank you, Madam Judge. J.P. Lundstrom has just <coughs> provided the lead in from where I wanted to go. Um, you had mentioned the high speed chases, as did he. And I want to recommend that you all read some of Mike Masterson's recent columns where he's dealt with the issue of high speed chases and that some law enforcement agencies are suspending doing that because you are at risk for killing somebody. I mean, your officers, the person you're pursuing, or innocent people along the highway, plus wrecking a vehicle. So I don't know what your policy is right now, but I would like for you to please give some consideration. I've read, to you're talking about Mike Masterson's columns. I've column. read all of his columns. I'm, I'm friends with Mike, and I, I'm familiar with exactly the columns you're talking about that he okay. wrote about in the last uh, month, six weeks, something like that. And of course, we're constantly uh, looking at those policies, and, and there is a, a debate across the country. I would hate to uh, ever uh, have a policy, though, that says we don't pursue and, because and that, that opens you to the door to policy. lawlessness. I mean, I respect what the sheriff's office does here, but I think Mike Masterson's columns are certainly yeah. worth heavy consideration. That's I all purposely, I, I hope I didn't even talk about pursuits. I said high-speed driving because we do do high-speed driving when we're trying to get to a sure, call. Sure, when the lady's husband shot. Yes, yes, yes. ma'am. Okay, thank you, Judge. <clears throat> well, you know, I've always supported you guys for the 14 years, 13 years I've been on here, and I've had several occasions to use you. My house was broken three times. That was before Tim was ever sheriff. Hasn't been since. Had a guy show up one time. He had one shoe on, screaming like a wild man at 3 in the morning and didn't take your deputy long to get there. He was bagging on the door trying to get in the house. He was hiring a guy on drugs. And I don't know how he got there because he said he lived somewhere down around West Fork. And like I said, he didn't have a car. Today I had an occurrence, you know, the security alarm the company called car. me and said that somebody was trying to break into my house. And the deputy was there before I was, and I'm just 10 minutes away. So I appreciate all you do, and I support you to the limit. Thank you. And thank you for just being there. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, as everyone knows, I don't like to spend money, but um, I believe the safety of our citizens and officers is important, so I'm going to support this also. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, we have a motion. We have a second. Any other discussion? Robert Dennis? Proud to vote yes. Lisa Ecke? Yes. Ann Harbison? Yes. Sharon Lloyd? Yes. Tom Lundstrom? Yes. Eva Madison? Yes. Sue Madison? Yes. Joel Maxwell? Yes. Gary McHenry? Yes. Joe Patterson? Yes. Butch Pond? Yes. Bill Ussery? Yes. Daniel Balls? Yes. Harvey Bowman? Yes. Rick Cochran? Yes. Thank you. We may Good evening. have to tag team on jail since it's the proverbial elephant in the room. To start with, we know you all have a hard job. We understand that uh, you've only got a finite amount of money, and you know, we understand that uh, it takes a lot of money to run a jail. Uh, but uh, we also know that you'll, uh, you all will uh, prioritize and uh, uh, allot the money to the uh, places that you feel are the most important. So. We're going to present our budget, what we think we need, and and uh, then we'll answer any questions. On the capital, like I say, you already heard all the scenarios. Uh, basically, what patrol does, we're asking for five vehicles. We have uh, uh, vehicles with the, the mileage on them, like I say, from about 80,000 up to 110,000. But our mileage is a little different as far as, you know, we everybody that leaves the jail has to be transported. And to the doctor, dentist, all the courts, 
and everything. And also, I talked to the prosecutor back here and got permission to throw him under the bus. You know how the system works. When a warrant comes out and we have to go get them across the states, we, we have to go everywhere. We had a scenario about 30 days ago to where we had about seven people out in the states that signed extradition. At one time, we had one in Oregon, California, and Arizona. That was one trip. We had three in Florida, and we had some in surrounding states. So we had to leave and go get every one of these people. Uh, with our current mileage now, we have drove 102,000 miles this year out of state alone. So these, these miles, when we're talking about having 80,000, 90,000 on them, what they'll have by the time the new vehicles get here. You know, we, uh, and as you know, you know, we have a duty to protect the, the prisoners. We have to haul them, uh, go get them, take care of them, and, you know, they're, they're with us all the time just about everywhere we go. So that's about all I have for, but, yeah, for that for that's our, questions. That's our, that's our uh, capital uh, vehicle capital. That's all we're asking for in the jail and capital is the vehicles. These, these are marked transport vehicles. Thank you, Judge. Um, do these vehicles go home? Yes. They do? Yes, they're all certified officers that are on call. Okay, so they're on call to go get pick up somebody at any time then? Yeah, even given okay. time, surrounding counties or whatever, they do come out. Okay. You know, like we was talking about, uh, you know, like the ice storm, tornado, or whatever issues, they're, they're on call for whatever happens. Something happens at the jail, you know, uh, transports the hospital or, or whatever. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you, Judge. Um, and, and I'll say that, at least for tax code purposes, when you're talking about take-home vehicles, the tax code recognizes law enforcement vehicles as very different. You all are not taxed the same way um, because I think the tax code observes properly that it's actually good to have law enforcement vehicles going home and out in the community. And, and like you said, well, I, I guess it was Rick that said it, these are really their offices to a large yes. extent. They don't have a base other than what's in their, um, what's in their vehicle. So I, I thought since our chief deputy was here, I was going to ask him a question. This isn't really about the jail request, but there's been a little press lately about somebody in another county driving a vehicle to Florida on vacation. I wondered if our sheriff's office had any policy on this or if there is anything, because the news at least reported that there wasn't anything that prohibited it. And so it was actually permissible for somebody to take their sheriff's vehicle to Florida on vacation. I think we have a county policy in our county blue book okay. that, well, I wonder, yeah, just, that prohibits uh, using county property for personal, pro, uh, personal okay. use. Okay, and so that's the way you all would interpret it. Right, so it would right, be, uh, yeah. in our situation, yeah. it would be a violation of county ordinance. Yes, okay. yeah, our county, our county uh, handbook has a section in there about, about uh, personal property of anything that, or I mean about county property of any kind that is used for personal use is uh, prohibited. It, may okay. I? Yes, please. Just Madison, I, I don't think there's an ordinance, but it is. I think. A, a personnel policy. Well, I think we pass it as with the effective ordinance in our personnel policy. I think we do that. The real, real handle would be somebody to get fired for doing that. Okay. Okay. Well, it's not necessarily germane to the budget topic, but I felt like it was worth mentioning while we right, were here right, talking yeah. about cars. <laughs> yes, we're, we're uh, uh, very aware of, of that recent uh, stuff in the newspaper about about the Minton County Chief Deputy, and, and uh, certainly we don't uh, allow that, and, and uh, it's not not a practice at our sheriff's oh. office. Okay. It was just the fact that you mentioned going to Oregon that made me think of it. So. Yeah, when we go there in uniform and a marked unit. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so you're asking for 150000 Is that correct? It's 155250 well, I'm looking I think at the, we got the wrong sheet then. Okay. Uh, 155 And how many vehicles? Five. Five? Yes, ma'am. Uh, you're getting these on state bid? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, Rick and I will order them all on the same same way. Same way. Yeah, same, same time. Yes, so state you're bid. getting ta Tahoes too? Yes. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll order these if we're approved the money in January. They won't be here till the end of March. You know, it's about a 90 year, okay. 100, 100 days before we uh, get delivery of them. So we're only doing cap capital tonight, correct? Okay, thank yes. you. Well, and personnel. Okay. We, we have you're a not personnel asking. request. We, 
and we'll address that. Uh, we, we can do it now or, or let you decide on the vehicles, however the, the court pleases. Well, I'm going to go on and make a motion that uh, we provide uh, 155000 uh, for five vehicles for the jail. Second. I've got two fifty. Oh, two fifty. All right. How many do you have right now? I, I'm just curious. How many vehicles do? In transport, there's yes. uh, uh, fourteen trans slots, and then there's two supervisors, sixteen cars. Sixteen, and that's what you currently have is six. And so this will add. This will make it twenty-one, or will this no. make it you know, these, sixteen? Well, these these uh, five will probably go out of service. They'll be passed down if they can be put somewhere else. Okay, so or you'll if, still if, remain if with 16. Be passed down to be traded in. Yeah, 16, 16 still in the transport division. And the transport. Okay, thank you. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Robert Dennis? Yes. Lisa Eckie? Yes. Ann Harbison? Yes. Sharon Lloyd? Yes. Tom Lundstrom? Yes. Eva Madison? Yes. Sue Madison? Yes. Joe Maxwell? Yes. Gary McHenry? Yes. Joe Patterson? Yes. Butch Pond? Yes. Bill Ussery? Yes. Daniel Balls? Yes. Harvey Bowman? Yes. Rick Cochran? Yes. Did you guys have anything else for your budget? Did you we have a, a personnel, personnel increase. Okay. We will, we will, we will, we're asking to uh, uh, upgrade 20 ADO positions to DFC positions. Uh, our primary reason behind that is, um, well, there's several reasons. These uh, people that are working in the booking area, this, this will be dedicated to our booking uh, area, and that area has become uh, uh, very, uh, a lot, lot more activity in our booking area, a lot more regulations, a lot more rules. We've been tasked with now doing a DNA sample on every felon that's arrested. In the past, uh, we only did DNA samples on, on uh, certain uh, uh, violent felons, so now we do every felon, and, and I can tell you, the, since this law has been in effect, we've had some felons that aren't interested in getting their DNA taken. <laughs> so uh, um, uh, we have uh, trying to sign people up now in the Affordable Care Act so that they can have insurance when they get out, so that uh, when they come back, that insurance is good for 30 days. Uh, we know just our recent recidivism report that was released, uh, almost 50 percent of the people come back to jail. So uh, that's a 30-day window there that we'll have, that they'll have insurance when they come back. Um, there's a new parole uh, and parole form that allows them to do 90 days in the county jail. That uh, now we're going to, for some reason, it, it fell to us to be able to determine if these people were the 90-day people. Uh, we still have to put them on ADC's list, and ADC might still call, but it's up to us to know that hey, they're doing 90 days in the county jail. Uh, that's a new, a new. Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, are you asking for additional people or no, job just, changes? No, just, just job changes. Just oh, okay. Upgrade, okay. Upgrade, I misunderstood. Yeah. Uh, their responsibilities have increased in that booking area, um, like say with the DNA and, and the uh, other mandates that we're we're trying to do, and um, so that, that's the reason to retain our. You know, we have two people today tested at Fayetteville for a, a position over there. So uh, obviously there there's uh, more money to be made at Fayetteville. Um, you know, for, for lack of a better term, the officers at Fayetteville rarely have to. To uh, go back and clean up a finger painter's cell, and uh, so when our people are doing that, so you know uh, they're, they're, <laughs> they're in some pretty uh, trying situations back there in the, in the jail with our mental health problems that we have. Uh, that's increased. Um, obviously, uh, there's some talk at the state level about trying to do something about the mental health about parole, but um, you know these 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 things aren't going to be fixed overnight. We didn't get in this situation overnight. We're not going to fix it overnight. We're hopeful that progress will be made. Totally. So that's, that's the reason we're asking to upgrade those. It's about a, uh, what is around a 50? A little over $57,000. $57,000 to upgrade those, uh, those people. J.P. Madison. Say again what the, the acronym stand for. It's something uh, detention officer. Adult detention officer. Adult, okay. Yes. And deputy then, first class. Okay. And so with these upgrades comes an actual addition of responsibilities. Yes. Okay. Yes. Because okay. we didn't like the DNA test. Uh, you know, this was mandated through the state, and like I say, we uh, we was counting up, and it's probably going to be over 4,000, 4,500. And in this, you know, there's not an option not to do it. It says, you know, you'll use reasonable force, have to put on a restraint chair, and that's everybody comes in. So there, there's not an option. 
Okay. And then on top of we uh, looking at our booking times, we was booking people right around 30 minutes if everything went good with that. The affordable health care, the DNA test, we're almost up to an hour now getting a person booked in and out. Well, this year will probably be 13,000 folks. And you all weren't here last night because you weren't up, but there was a question that I had asked about the upgrade of a position that did not come with it the upgrade of duties and I had a problem with that because it was just an upgrade in compensation and I couldn't figure out why you needed two separate positions for that. So this upgrade is in yeah, fact an addition of responsibility. responsibility. Okay. As we was talking about the, quite a bit more responsibility. Yes. And you also that, know how much it's going to cost. So yeah. And the two that uh, I was talking about test for February, last officer uh, 30 days ago had been here a year, got him trained up and he went to Prairie Grove. And, uh, uh, and like I say, one time this year we were 16 people down. Just people, like I say, get in there in this situation. You know, we're at all-time high. We broke a record. 726 was our uh, high population. You know, 710 is our capacity. So, it, so it's everything's uh, stretching everything to the max. It, then is it 57,000 total? Is that the right number? 57, like 271, I believe, I think is the exact. 57, 271? Okay, then I move to pass the um, upgrade of the 20 ADO slots to DFC and one DFC to corporal. Um, for $57,271. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Jay Lundstrom. I don't have very much pertinent to say. I just like this checking their DNA <laughs> because that's a sure proof down the road if they're arrested somewhere else for a rape or what have you, then we know what their DNA is. Yes, once this database gets bigger as it grows, yes, yes, it'll be fantastic. I think that's going to be one of the finest things that's ever happened in law enforcement because we've had a lot of people in prison for 20 or 30 years that weren't guilty that DNA released. So I really like DNA as a proof of a crime. So I know it's more burden on your people, but I think it's very well worth it. Thank you. Thank you, Bowman. Thank you, Judge. What uh, is an oral swab what you do for the DNA? Yes, yeah. And they're really ob objecting to and resisting that? Well, they, uh, part of them are saying, hey, I'm, I've been charged with a felony, but I'm not being convicted of a felony. But the law says charged, and then there's a remedy in place if you're not convicted that you can have that removed from the database. But it's up to the uh, offender uh, t to do that process, to have it removed. It's not our responsibility. But, uh, yeah, some of them... And, and it's a new process, and as, as they get educated, I think it'll, it'll get if, easier. If they, if they resist, you have to forcibly take yes, an oral yeah. swab. The Crown said we, we usually have to strap them in a restraint chair and then, uh, you know, bring extra people in. And, and, and open up. Most of them, once that threat is made no, to them, that that's what we have to do. You know, we don't have a choice, yeah. then they'll go ahead and comply. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. And this, this test is, it is kind of lengthy because you have to put on gloves. You can't be breathing or sneezing when you're taking that. You know, it's a, it's a, it takes a little bit of time to get it done right. J.P. Lloyd. Because I think this is fascinating, is it just for felonies or do you do the DNA for everybody? Just, just felonies. Just felonies. Okay. Thank you. Could we have a motion? I'm sorry, J.P. Pond. I, I wanted to make sure I, I heard that correctly. This is going to be for the booking personnel. This this increase we're yes. talking about. The booking personnel, and then, you know, part of this goes on to the back, where we're plumb, where them folks are back there every day having to, you know, if you're not up here doing the DNA, you're back here trying to feed them and fight them and and get get them to court and do all that. So yes, it's for the booking and, and <coughs> part of the back. Okay, then everybody in booking plus some of the people in the back yes. are going through some this. Some of the more experienced, yes. Okay, very good. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Any other discussion? Carly, call the roll, please. Robert Dennis? Yes. Lisa Eckie? Yes. Ann Harbison? Yes. Sharon Lloyd? Yes. Tom Lundstrom? Yes. Eva Madison? Yes. Sue Madison? Yes. Joe Maxwell? Yes. Gary McHenry? Yes. Joe Madison? Yes. Butch Pond? Yes. Bill Ussery? Yes. Daniel Balls? Yes. Harpy Bowman? Yes. Rick Cochran? Yes. Thank you, fellas. Thank you, Madam Judge. Uh -huh. Members of the Thank board. you. The next thing on the agenda is financial management. Cheryl? Cheryl Bollinger, Comptroller. <clears throat> um, 
I guess the first place I'd ask you to look is on that page 307 in the blue book, and it, it tells you what um, the comptroller's department does. That's the, we have payroll <coughs> and accounts payables, um, purchasing, and then the general ledger budgets, the comptroller stuff. Um, the reason I'm here tonight is just because it's a unique request because what we've done this year, we've combined purchasing with comptroller. So we're combining those into one department. We're not really asking for capital and not asking for um, increase in, in either department as far as more personnel. The combination of the two overall, the end result was we were reducing the total budget by 7,334. But that's why I wanted to bring it because it was kind of a unique situation. I wasn't sure when the best time to present that would be. <clears throat> You have any questions? I know, I think you've heard me voice my concerns about the combination of these functions before. And while I like to see a budget reduction, I think that on the principle of the matter, I can't support the combination of these two functions. I think Sarbanes-Oxley is something that we've all heard about, that corporations have to comply with Sarbanes-Oxley. One of the primary components of Sarbanes-Oxley is what's called segregation of duties. And segregation of duties talks about the various financial functions that an organization does and talks about why it's very important to have division between those duties to, to basically have fraud prevention. I'm not suggesting that anybody or one person is going to do that, but it takes away the temptation, <coughs> takes away the opportunity, and these functions are functions that need to remain separate. I realize this body does not have the authority to say to our executive branch, don't do this, but I think by our combining these two budgets into one overall category of financial management is essentially blessing what I consider to be an improper segregation of duties. I think you should not combine all the functions in this office that are there. You're taking purchasing, combining it with accounts payable, with payroll, with auditing, all those things, if you look at Sarbanes-Oxley as the model, those are things that do not belong under one person. And so I have to oppose based on principle. So I hope you understand. This may be a question for Steve. Uh, what's the, what do the state auditors, what's, what's their uh, opinion on this? I, I would like to answer that. The auditors are fine with it. <clears throat> we actually are audited now with their IS department, which is, is new. They've just been doing it a couple of years, and our audit actually passed. <clears throat> and the reason it does is because of the security in our department. Although it's sort of four departments in one, like purchasing cannot get into the AP side and do stuff in the AP. They can't go in and pay bills. Um, they can still only do what their job descriptions are. Um, it's the same. <clears throat> it's the same way. So the security is there. The the auditors, the IS auditors, have come in and they have audited us with the state. So they are good with that. We've already passed that audit. Thanks to Ashley working really hard with IT and IT. Um, we had five little comments, and two of them was ours that we had to make it a little more secure, and three of them was with IT. And um, <clears throat> to get into our com individual computers, like nobody in my department can go in and get into my computer unless I cut my finger off and go use it because we're fingerprint read only. We can't get in with a password. So um, it's very secure. <clears throat> right. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Thank you. Well, Butch stole my thunder there because that was uh, my question was uh, what did the auditors, because I know uh, in separation of things in school districts yeah. that they really frowned on combining some of those things. But if it, you know, passes with the auditors, auditors and we save seven thousand dollars i'll vote for it thank you i wanted to emphasize one point what we need to understand is that purchasing was previously a direct report to the judge as was the comptroller those have now been all combined into one office under one official currently the comptroller whoever that person might be that's the concern it's not that somebody could log into somebody else's computer because certainly we have information um, you know, IS and IT protections that prevent that. It's the residing of the functions under a single person. It's that responsibility that's problematic. <coughs> and I think we need to be really careful about blessing that by a, a, a 
approving the combination of these departments. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Judge. Um, with what I do, I'm familiar with Sarbanes-Oxley as the way it pertains to my industry, but I wondered if our county attorney could maybe shed a little light on um, this situation and the particulars around it. The Sarbanes-Oxley does not, by its terms, uh, include uh, government entities. So uh, doing it this way uh, would not violate uh, any federal law. Um, I don't know if you need a more in-depth answer than that, uh, Justice Maxwell, but it, it does, it, it's corporate governance. It's not government governance. Two things. One is make sure we're not legally liable, but I think also in the public forum we need to make sure that we don't have the, the appearance of, of uh, impropriety. Is there, is this, even if there's not a federal, I guess, law that we're breaking, is there the appearance and is there context or precedent for this not being a good policy? Uh, Cheryl, uh, Ms. Bollinger wants to speak to this, but you addressed the question to me. Um, the, and I guess the, the um, there are a couple things to consider in that. Uh, as Justice Madison just pointed out, before uh, the purchaser worked for, uh, administratively worked for Ms. Bollinger, she administratively worked for actually a chief of staff who in turn worked for the judge. The, uh, Eventually, that pyramid goes up to one person anyway. Um, secondly, um, with uh, due respect to Sarbanes-Oxley, which I think is a uh, actually probably a good idea for a whole bunch of reasons, um, it doesn't stop people from uh, who wish to do bad things with public money from doing bad things with public money. And as I said, while we were discussing purchasing policy a couple of meetings ago, um, all, you don't have to look far from this courthouse, in fact, to find people with access to public money who wish to do bad things. What I guess I'm telling you, it, Justice Maxwell, is that the, the idea that segregating these duties, if it's, if it's an appearance, that's for you all to decide. I'll, actually, it's not. Let me take, take that back. It's actually for the judge to decide. She's, she has the authority uh, to combine these departments. The, uh, if you wish to comment on that and say it's not a good idea, then obviously the court can do that. But um, whether it appears to be improper, um, you essentially pushed one peer on the administrative chain uh, from Ms. Bollinger uh, when the judge undertook to do this to work for her. And that's essentially what this, this move did a year ago or thereabouts. Can I ask one follow-up question to that? I guess what are the potential opportunities for this if the worst people were in these positions um, 10 years in the future, what are the potential for this to be misused? Joel, uh, Justice Maxwell, sorry. I, I, that's a question that's probably well beyond my um, my predictive capability tonight. Um, my sense is um, if you get a bad person, and let me just say this, uh, you know, Tawny Town recently, right, that's the, the illusion I keep, right, that person was completely independent, right, didn't answer to the mayor, didn't answer to the council, uh, an elected official, okay? Uh, people picked that person and got what they got, unfortunately. Um, so I don't know that that I can give you an answer that would be satisfactory to you in terms of this particular issue. Let me let me rephrase that because I think I gave you a question that would be very difficult to quantify um, compared to the way we run the county business in general. Does this have a higher propensity for abuse? I don't know. I, I don't. I, I still don't know that I can answer that question. That I'm, I have sort of a statistical background to do that. I really believe, uh, personally, 
uh, and I believe this is backed up anecdotally, that it depends on the person you get in that office more than anything else. Um, and if they are smart and dishonest, right, um, as we have seen at, say, the University of Arkansas, where uh, a person in the athletic department reaped hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, they have a chance to be relatively well off for a long time before they get caught. If they're not so smart and dishonest, they're going to get caught quicker. And I, I, th those are all factors that lend me to say this particular structural change to me, I can't tell you it's riskier or, or not. Uh, I, I agree with Justice Madison's sentiment that Sarbanes-Oxley is a good, good particular um, law, a good policy for a whole bunch of reasons. But in this particular case, it's difficult for me to say with kind of a definitive answer, a structural change like this was or was not more risky than the way we had done business up until the end of 2014. I just don't have that. I can't answer your question right. Okay. Thanks. Hi there. Thank you. Help me understand and just give me the simple version of why we combined those two departments. I mean, why did we do that? Was there, was there uh, just Lasky a County <clears throat> has had it that way for years. Okay. Um, and the reason that I'm asking to combine these is because they've both been put under my jurisdiction, I guess. And um, the reason I did that is because the county judge told me to. Okay. But, I mean, is there a, is there a, a great reason that, I mean, it, I mean, I know it's going to save funds here, but. It will. And, hope, and, and the thing I don't know, and I was concerned about, and now when I looked at this budget and the spending in each department this year, I couldn't really see a way of cutting those much more. <clears throat> but after we do it combined for a year, it might make a difference. I, I don't okay. know. I, I'm trying to think of ways that it might. Um, okay. I know my department is awesome at looking at things and in, in ways of saving money. Right. We meet every Friday morning, and things that's happened during the week that everybody in our department needs to know about, you know, we discuss those things, and we discuss ways of, saving time, saving money, different ways of, of doing things. So it was for more efficiency? <clears throat> and it's and it does make it much more efficient because okay. basically that department's right there with us okay. and now it is literally with us and so there's not a great reason to have it two different in the budget, to have two different ones. Okay. Thank you. Um Cheryl and Steve have answered the questions I was gonna ask. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Judge and Cheryl. Excuse excuse what I'm about to say because it has nothing to do with personalities or people. But I have locks on my doors at home to keep honest people out. You don't keep a crook out with a lock on your door. They come right on in. So sometimes you just need to have things in place to keep honest people honest. And it sounds to me like that we've changed something that might not be the right way so I, i'm not as clear as i need to be about it but right now I'll, I'll vote no just also to say i don't think this is quite right it just doesn't seem right and also i've got a little something else that i'm not going to talk about that i know and and uh, so i'm going to vote no excuse me for it um, a couple of things about this number one it's only as good as the controls that we have. But it, but looking at the way that we've done it, at least from my observation, there are walls and barriers and things to keep people from doing things, no matter who's in charge, that is completely separated. And, and uh, uh, just like Mr. Zega was saying earlier, uh, eventually everybody's going to report to somebody at the top. And so I think in this case it makes perfect sense because there is those barriers in place. and, and and she's the person in charge, and they may report to her, but they all have separate functions, and they're completely independent. And they all have a set of things they have to go through. Purchasing still has all the processes to go through for it to be approved. And they have to be signed off, and they have to be approved. And it, it's she's not the ultimate. Uh, only where there's something big does she even get involved in, in making those decisions for each department. 
that they are completely independent. And I think that's why the auditors, uh, they certainly know what they're doing, and I trust them, and I also trust the way it's organized at the moment. So thank you. I'd like to add something to that. Um, no duties have changed. Um, no securities have changed. So if purchasing in Comptroller or purchasing AP or whoever was going to get together and try to scam the county, that could have been done anyway with two separate budgets because nothing really changed as far as the processes. The only thing that changed was instead of having two department heads right there basically doing the same thing, now there's one and there's, there would just be one budget. So really, as far as what you're discussing as far as the security, that did not change. The security has actually gotten, gotten tighter because of the IS audit with the state auditors because they come in and now they're actually looking at our computers and our processes and how we do it to make sure that that's all um, as secure as it can be. Obviously, you know, nothing is as secure as we would like it, but <clears throat> so nothing's really changed. The only thing's changed is just asking for it to all come out of one budget, so. I'm looking at Pulaski County's website and they have separate offices for comptroller purchasing and payroll. Right. So they're not, they're not combined functions according to what Pulaski County is saying. So I'm going to move to, to turn down this request. Second. Uh, Second. I talked to, I talked to the comptroller down there. They are all under him. It's all under the comptroller. Just like if you look at our website, you'll see a purchasing website and you'll see a comptroller website. The, the reason for that is because we don't want to put purchase under the comptroller because if you're a buyer and you're wanting to look at the auctions or the bids that we have, you're not going to, you may not know to go look under comptroller for bids. You're going to look for, at, for purchasing. And that's the same way. That's why Pulaski County does that. It's just like we actually are four different departments, just like they are, but it's all under the comptroller. <clears throat> I'll call the question to the extent we need to. Clarify, we're, we're about to vote no, to turn down this request. Justice that, Madison's uh, motion is to uh, deny the request. That's correct. I'm sorry, J.P. Harbison, I did not have you down. Okay, well, I do want to speak, speak on, on Please go right ahead. Go, go ahead. This was an uh, administrative decision, and, and I don't really, I'm kind of confused of why it's even coming to the court if, the county judge has the authority to do this. I mean, we can disagree with it or whatever. Uh, can you fill me in, Cheryl? It, we're not asking to combine the departments. We're asking just to combine the budgets. The departments will still be under one department, but the budgets right now are currently under two, and we did not want to change that in the middle of the year. So we would, con we would finish the 2015 budget, although we're, we'd be paying next year <clears throat> some of the 2015 invoices in January, we would still pay them out of separate budgets, but January 1, all the 2016, I'm just asking to pay it out of one budget. Okay, so what we're doing here, if we deny this, then what we're doing is that you'll have to have two separate budgets and mm -hmm. it's still under you. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Yeah, restate it. Yeah, make sure that they know exactly what we're voting on. The, I have a parliamentary question. Okay, go ahead. I didn't think that you could make a negative motion. Yes, you can. Uh, it's she can do that. Um, I, let me uh, give you the short answer, Justice Harbison. And yes, the, the motion's in order. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, the motion is to deny. Uh, the unified budget. Uh, Justice Madison, did I state your motion fairly? That's correct. So yes, and vote for is the second, Mr. Lundstrom, did I? Did, no, uh, yeah. I thought it was. I thought it was. Tom, Tom no. At the same time. Uh, uh, thank you. Okay, so a yes vote. A yes vote denies the unified budget. And a no vote supports. And a no vote. Well, no vote doesn't do anything yet. Uh, and that's kind of. See, that's not. So, do you know what you're voting on? Barnett, call the roll. Robert Dennis? Yes. Lisa Eckie? Yes. 
Ann Harbison? No. Sharon Lloyd? No. Tom Lundstrom? Yes. Eva Madison? Yes. Sue Madison? Yes. Joe Maxwell? No. Gary McHenry? No. Joe Patterson? Yes. Butch Pond? No. Bill Ussery? No. Daniel Balls? No. Harvey Bowman? I don't know. <laughs> you can't do that again. I'm Quit stunned. twitching. No. Rick Cochran? No. Nine six. Nine six failed. Yes, I am. Uh, I'm going to make a motion that uh, the financial management or the controller and purchasing, purchasing operation be one budget. Is that a correct motion? I think, didn't you just need to do that, the reduction thing? No. Well. It's one budget. Yeah, that they be. Yeah, but this is the request. Steve, can you no. here? Well, sure. just, Justice Matt, uh, sorry, Justice Harbison's motion is in order. It's germane to what you're doing tonight. Um, but well, is that for lack of a, a more delicate way to put this, I don't think it's complete because there's another line in there that talks about uh, her operating budget being reduced by 70. Okay. Well, I'll make the – I will add this to it then that uh, the request is a reduction of $7,334 from last year's approved budget. Second. I thought that with all of these requests that were coming through, we were not considering overall budgets. Every one of these other requests, we have only looked at the specific item. And this to me signifies that we are now approving the entire budgets, which we've, we've not given those any thought. So I don't, I don't think we can vote on an overall reduction unless we are going to consider the full budget as presented, which we have not considered. This is last year's. But my, my quick, I mean, when I asked, I've asked it twice at both the meetings where we've discussed these issues, are we considering the whole budgets or the specific issues that are being brought before us, and we were told that we are considering only the specific items. With respect to the sheriff, we approved the vehicles and the positions and sent them back, and they will have to return if we would like to then talk to them about their full budgets. This, to me, suggests we're giving overall approval to a budget that we have not been presented with, at least in our packet. I know we've gotten it, but I did not understand that we were approving full budgets because I look at this and say that regardless of whether there's a reduction, we still should pay attention to particular line items to see where there might be increases that we think are not deserving of increases. And I'm not prepared to do that. And I, I did not think we were doing that. So I, I don't think given what the agenda items were set with us before that we should be approving the budget for this department. Yes, J.P. Thank you, Judge. Uh, I took it that the motion is to combine the controller and purchasing budgets into one. The net effect is a request of uh, reducing the request, but we're not approving their budgets. We're approving combi consolidating the two for, with further consideration. So I'm asking, <laughs> may I ask of Justice Harbison if that is her intent of this yes. motion? Yes. Okay. Then I my. Judge, may I? Yes, please. Um, I, I'll point this out with, uh, again. Until you all vote on an appropriation ordinance, right. all of these things are preliminary. Um, and understanding Justice Madison's concern that th this is not necessarily either a capital or a personnel okay. request, um, that none of what you're doing, none of what you have done, is yet has the force of law. Thank you, Judge. I guess this is a question for the judge. Uh, judge, would it increase your duties uh, substantially to go ahead and assign one of the people in purchasing and one of the people in the other area to report directly to you and have a separate budget rather than have Cheryl handle both of them? No, it will not increase my responsibility. It was just a little bit more cooperative to have them all have on the meetings 
everybody being included. Uh, but I can handle it. That's no problem. The only thing is it's going to cost you more money. Okay. That's just that simple. Okay. All right. Thank you. Because any time you are going to take a full position as a purchasing coordinator, mm -hmm. the person that's doing the job now does not have that title. And once you have that title, the salary will go up okay. and you'll have an increase in your budget, which I thought what you were trying to do was cut budgets. Okay. But I'll be more than glad to take it over. I'll be more than glad to do it. I will be glad to create a department, and I'll be glad to raise her salary. Thank you, Judge. I think that clarifies the situation. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yes. Debbie Madison. Madam Judge, I'm curious why this is even on our agenda tonight, because all the budgets we heard last night, all the budgets we've heard tonight, have dealt only with personnel and capital. This does neither. Cheryl, explain that, please. I do, I know, but go ahead. Um, what this was in the beginning was just for unique requests, and if you'll note, you remember the ambulance was on here also because they were asking for the extra 100000 It was anybody who came back with some orders. Okay, let me start over. This was just put together. Whenever I looked at the budgets, I looked at things that if I was a JP, I would want to know up front some of the unique requests that was coming down. Although this isn't asking for more money, it is a unique request because it's combining two budgets into one. Um, the ambulance was on here um, it because and it, it wasn't capital personnel. It was because they had the large request they were asking for. Um, just anything that was unique that I thought that would be interesting that you would want to know up front before you started looking at individual budgets. Um, it might have been a bad idea, apparently, but I thought it was a good one at the time. J.P. Harbison. <laughs> I don't think that, you know, by combining these uh, budgets, then you'll bring that budget back uh, for people to inspect if they want to inspect it. Uh, according to line items that they want to add additional funding or question why something's in a certain line item. I don't think that that denies this, and I think that is the question that's being asked, that once we approve this that you don't come back. And so I'm going to go on and call the question that we vote on this. I think it, it's appropriate for us to vote on it, but I do want the understanding that you will come back with the combined budget so everybody can inspect that budget. Thank you. J.P. Maxwell. Just a point of clarification. Are we, are we voting to um, approve combining the budgets, or is that an executive decision made at your level? The, may I engage? Yes, please. Justice Maxwell and Colloquy. The, the decision to combine the personnel uh, is an executive decision. Y'all can within legal limits, uh, split these budgets if you wish to do that or combine them if you wish to do this. So it's within the purview of the court to do what uh, Comptroller uh, Bollinger is asking you to do tonight. Does that make sense? Somewhat. So I'm, I'm trying to decide if this I, is I an executive decision that that is and we're talking about a peripheral issue no, you, or if this is an executive decision, but one that is at the pleasure of the court. The, the, no, the executive decision has been made. Um, judge, um, judge combined, took the, uh, uh, essentially Cheryl's peer, uh, Ms. Bollinger's peer, the purchasing director, and made that position a, it did a couple things with it in, in terms of personnel, but made that person direct report to Cheryl, okay? She has the legal authority to do that. What, uh, what this request does, and it is within your purview to say, no, we're not going to do that, uh, is to keep, uh, just like the sheriff, I'll use the sheriff for an example, right? You heard two different budgets from the sheriff tonight that have different light on you. You, are, you should do it that way for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, with respect to Cheryl's budget, she's just asking you to recognize her running one budget for her department. Thank you. And, and that's your and that's your call. Thank you. So where are we? Are we? You, so now, and you're okay. Now, it, and there's anybody else who wants to be recognized, you're going to have to vote on the question, Judge. 
But okay, and now tell them exactly what we're voting on. Uh, Ms. Harbison, uh, Justice Harbison's motion was to uh, consolidate the budget. I'm sorry, combine the budgets uh, with the uh, uh, $7,300 reduction that results from that. Okay, Carly, would you call the roll, please? Robert Dennis. Abstain. Lisa Eckie. No. Ann Harbison. Yes. Sharon Lloyd. Yes. Tom Lundstrom. No. Eva Madison. No. Sue Madison. No. Joe Maxwell. No. Gary McHenry. Yes. Joe Patterson. No. Butch Pond. Yes. Bill Ussery. Yes. Daniel Walls. Yes. Harvey Bowman. No. Rick Cochran. Robert Dennis. I'm oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, the abstention has actually the effect of a no vote. The uh, the motion failed. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Cheryl. You're welcome. <coughs> <coughs> The next thing we have on here is discussion on the future uh, 2016 budget request to be reviewed. I sent out an uh, email to all of you this week, did not get any answers from anyone. But what I'm going to refer to the opinion or the options you have before you, you've got three options. And if those, I don't remember getting it. Did everybody get it? There was an email sent out. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, well, Tom got it. Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't see you wanted to respond. But I didn't understand that anybody asked us to respond before tonight. Well, did you read it? Did everybody read it? Yes. So you know what it says? I didn't get an email from you. Read it for these people that didn't get it. Steve, read this for them, please. Uh, My voice is not crap. The uh, options that the judge is laying out for reviewing the uh, operating budgets are one, review all budgets, requesting increases in operating categories. Uh, it means you would not elect to review any budgets that either stayed the same or asking for less in their 2015 budgets, less in 2016 than they asked for in 2015, or uh, Corn Court can either keep the two operating categories as option two. Uh, funded at the same level in, as in the current budget, or the court can suggest a percentage increase or decrease, or three, the court can decide to review every single bit budget individually uh, for 2016, whether the request is increased, decreased, or staying flat. Uh, the budget last year was reviewed line <coughs> by line, uh, line item by line item, sorry, and that took seven meetings. And the judge wants to know the pleasure of the court. Yes. Go ahead, Madison. So we've already spent three meetings discussing budgets and we've approved not one single budget because of the piecemeal fashion with which we've done this. So I think now we have to look at whether we want to review every individual budget. And let me give you my thoughts. Is Although I go through some of these and I find that I don't have many questions, what I look at is even for the budgets that stay flat or have slight reductions, if you start paying attention to the details of those budgets, what you'll see is, and I'll give you an example, because of the way we budget with small equipment and things like that appearing in sort of operating budgets, not as one-time expenditures, someone could have spent $5,000 last year on a one-time purchase for equipment that we knew when we approved it that it was a one-time expense. So if this year they come in with a flat budget, they've actually effectively increased their operating expenses because they've simply absorbed that $5,000 back into their annual expenses when we should have seen a $5,000 reduction. So to some extent, a budget staying flat is not necessarily what we always want. I think there's always room because of those one-time expenditures to do better. The same thing about even modest reductions. Same phenomenon can be at work. I'll also say that I was surprised that if we were supposed to be in the past three meetings considering unique requests, our public defender's budget is going up by almost $60,000 and yet it was not among those that we considered 
even though I consider that fairly unique. Um, so I went through and tried to figure out which ones of these budgets would I be okay not reviewing. It was kind of hard for me to give anybody a pass because I feel like we need to hear from these people. So if I look at the options as presented, I really see only the option of having everybody come to us, even though that's a little painful, nobody likes it. Otherwise, I don't know how we're going to ever really see the detail and get the questions answered we want. I've also been an opponent in the past to just flat out percentage reductions because I don't think that's fair to anyone. I don't think it's us doing our job to say, well, everybody's just got to take a X percent cut. That doesn't account for the realities of individual departments or the fact that one department may be able to withstand a greater cut and one department may not. Um, so I think if we're going to be doing our due diligence and fulfilling our duties as the overseer of the budget, we need to have these departments come in. And unfortunately, despite the past three intensive time consuming meetings, we've got to look at all of them still. So that's, that's my opinion. Thank you, Madam Judge. I feel that it's very important for us to look at each budget, the whole budget. And I really wish we'd had this question presented to us before we started on this piecemeal fashion that we're doing it now. But just as an example tonight to consider, I think the um, tax collector mentioned move, putting a new person at the revenue office with the hope in a year or two phasing that person out. Well, if we don't ever look at those issues again and just see that there's no change in his budget, there's nobody to remind him what about that position you were going to phase out. I think we need to do that. We may find surprises that have existed in budgets for years that we wished weren't there. I think last year there may have been a surprise, or perhaps the year before, about the amounts that various departments were spending on food, that I don't see any real reason for our county offices to be buying food short of the detention facility and the sheriff. So I think it is important. It's educational for new members, and it's part of our job. We need to look at the budgets, the whole budgets, each and every one. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Well, I took the time to mark my pages. And you can see all the little tabs here, ones that I definitely have a question on. And some of them, well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe somebody else has a question. So I will move that we look at each budget, schedule them as a, as a uh, series of nights to do that, and uh, we'll get it done. Robert Dennis? Yes. Lisa Eckie? Yes. Ann Harbison? Yes. Sharon Lloyd? Yes. Tom Lundstrom? Yes. Eva Madison? Yes. Sue Madison? Yes. Joe Maxwell? Yes. Gary McHenry? Yes. Joe Patterson? Yes. Butch Pond? Yes. Bill Ussery? Yes. Daniel Balls? Yes. Harvey Bowman? Yes. Rick Cochran? Yes. There is just one moment, Judge, if I may, please. On October 22nd, we is scheduled a tentative, I believe, form, I mean, meeting, budget meeting, and that is the Lincoln Day dinner. So just thought I'd bring that up. Carly's going to be in town. Huh? Carly's going to be in town. Why don't you want to go here? Budgets are budgets, and whatever, but play fall. Yes, J.P. Cochran. Thank you, Judge. Uh, I believe we all turned in our dates that we were available to the girls. Did, did any of them do that? I know I did. Yeah, because I think everybody needs to make that information available so that we can it make sure. It will be totally impossible to get everyone's dates to coincide. I understand that. There's a week in October. I will be gone. That's what I'm saying. So yeah. good luck getting your budgets done. <laughs> this meeting's adjourned. <laughs>